Well, once again, good morning, everybody. My name is James Pasternak, Councilor Ward 6, York Center. I'm the chair of North York Community Council and we'll be chairing today's meeting. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'll be calling meeting 32 to order. Welcome, everybody. Today's meeting is being held with members of council and city staff participating both by video conference and in person at North York Civic Center in the council chamber. North York Civic Center is once again open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the meeting in the council chamber today. The public may continue to participate electronically by video conference. This meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com backslash Toronto City Council Live. Clerk staff have connected remote public speakers to the meeting by video conference and there are public speakers in the room with us today. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the North York Community Council webpage at toronto.ca backslash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. In a couple of minutes we'll be moving a motion to cut off the speakers by 10 a.m. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials on toronto.ca backslash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff will be available for members in the chamber and remotely if you need help with your devices. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speaker's list and will call on members when is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure they turn on their video and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, this is a paperless meeting, and I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve all your motions by email. Staff are available at nycc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are in different locations today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Ashwanabi, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do have an interest, please raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. I do not see uh, any hands going up either in the chamber or remotely. I may have a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on April the 20th, 2022. So moved, Mr. Chair. Moved by Councillor Carroll. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. I understand the clerk that we have one new business item uh, from Councillor Cole. May I ask, members, uh, ask the member to introduce the item and we'll ask for a motion to add it to the agenda. Uh, Councillor Cole. Yeah, can I see the uh, item? Yes, yeah, so North York Council, parking change Glen Park Avenue to support local business, uh, recommendation North York Community Council, amend the existing parking for a maximum period of 30 minutes from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. under credit on south side of Glen Park Avenue behind the adjustment all the way to Glen Park. Uh, North York Community Council rescind the existing parking prohibition effect from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on South Side Glen Park. Anyways, uh, in a nutshell, uh, this poor lady. Yeah, Councilor Cole, you're just we're just. Okay, add it, it to the agenda. Okay. Okay. All those in favor of adding it to the agenda? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Before we proceed with the agenda today, I have a few remarks on the hundredth anniversary of the incorporation of North York and city staff have prepared a presentation on this event. I assume this is ready uh, to roll and I will begin my remarks. We can move it now. There is, there is one motion I'd like to move early. At, at, most meetings, we do have a cutoff for speakers. They keep coming in. Uh, at, uh, we'd like to cut it off at 10 a.m. So I'd like to move a motion, if the clerk can put it on the screen. Uh, the speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 10 a.m., uh, which is in a little over 15 minutes, on May the 24th, 2022, after which no further registration is allowed, and the speakers list will be closed. Uh, I should point out that any, any people who miss that deadline uh, many of these items do go to City Council and you can provide written correspondence uh, to City Council should you miss your opportunity to speak here. The motion is on the screen. 
All, all those in favor? Did we have larger font on the screen? Opposed? <laughs> oh, seriously, it's too small. Uh, that is carried. I've asked for a few minutes to bring members of the North York Community Council and members of the public an update on the work done thus far to celebrate the upcoming 100th anniversary of the incorporation of North York as a borough. Monday, June the 13th, 2022, will mark the centennial of the incorporation of North York. I should point out that on June the 18th of that same year, uh, of uh, 19, <laughs> 19, 19, 1922, um, it was it was received royal assent. So there's actually two days, June the 13th and June the 18th, a significant milestone in our city's history, and that will be recommended with programs and events throughout the year. I've been asked to share an update with my colleagues on North York Community Council and the general public. The story of the past 100 years of North York is one of transformation from rural farmland. It's one of Canada's most vibrant inner suburbs. The celebration of such milestones is a crucial lesson in local history, allowing us to learn where we were, where we are, and where we were going. Much history is global, international, and out of our reach. This is local history, where many of us and our parents grew up, went to school, started families and businesses, and one by one built the transformative city of North York. At the time of its incorporation, North York was an agricultural hub with scattered villages and a population of 6,000 seeking better representation and investment in their community. Progress with economy is the motto. Township got underway with establishing police, fire, and other departments organized to serve the people of North York. Though some of its early growth was stifled due to depression and world wars, North York began a shift in, to manufacturing and aviation, aerospace, computing, and pharmaceuticals, which spurred tremendous growth. Some of the most iconic corporate names in commerce and business have found a home in North York employing tens of thousands of workers, and in the case of medical sciences, life sciences, and pharmaceutical, saving millions of lives worldwide. Its increasing population with the arrival of newcomers saw a need for expansion of residential, commercial, and industrial development, as well as transit. During this period, the North York we know today began to take shape with the building of iconic modernist structures, many of which remain notable landmarks. North York also set the standard in expanding parkland in the face of intensive development and developing a network of schools, hospitals, and other institutions that set a world standard. In 1967, it became the borough of North York, and then on Valentine's Day in 1979, graduated to city status. Affectionately known as the city with heart, larger than life mayor Mel Lastman at its helm. Today, an integral an integrated part of Toronto, which welcomes newcomers to Canada from all over the world. North York maintains its big heart. In recognition of this significant milestone, the city and its partners, including North York Historical Society, York University, North York Arts, as well as some private sector partners, present events and activities in the spirit of learning about the past, celebrating the present, and sharing our hopes for the future. Progress Economy and Heart. City Archives will launch Progress Economy and Heart, celebrating 100 years of North York, a retrospective virtual exhibit that tells the story of North York's transformation over 100 years, shown through archival photos and documents. With the return of Dor Doors Open Toronto this year on May the 27th and 28th, a number of significant North York buildings will, be open, will open their doors to visitors. Walking tours. Featured doors open walking tours will guide visitors through Downsview, Hogs Hollow, TTC, Art Crawl, and York University campus. The North York Historical Society. North York Historical Society's talks program will continue. Some talks feature Mel Lastman's influence on North York, history of Young Street, Sunnybrook Hospital, Growth in the aircraft industry in Canada and Connaught Laboratory's role in the First World War. 
There will be a North York Historical Society photo exhibit. Photo exhibit celebrating 100 years of North York will open on June the 18th at North York Central Library in association with the North York Historical Society. Mel Lastman Square, kicking off the summer with a Canada Day celebration. Mel Lastman Square will be a summer destination featuring Cultura, a weekly Friday night summer festival, Sunday serenades. The staple of arts, music, and culture in North York will incorporate activities to mark the 100th anniversary. 100 Years of Stars. Though much has changed in 100 years, the night sky remains the same. To commemorate the centennial, visitors are invited to the New York University Allen Carswell Observatory for an evening of stargazing the last weekend of July. New Blanche. New Blanche returns in October with its featured art hub in and around North York Civic Center, Mel Lastman Square, and the Meridian Center for the Arts. North York Arts will commission a visual artwork in public setting that will honor the past and celebrate the future of North York. The art group will honor many of the historical, uh, many historical dates and uh, events in history. And of course, um, private sector partners will also be participating. Doing that. Yes, no, we have to politicize no, that. Was, well, you you know what, a that. meeting's not a meeting until you blame my cares for something. Yes, yes. Yes, and uh, and I think you we, walked right into that one, Councillor Minowa. <laughs> but I think we should also uh, blame uh, Mel Lastman for creating this city, and I hope that during this uh, uh, ceremonial uh, uh, recognition, that we do something to honor uh, the great uh, building that uh, Mel Lastman did, and his service as North York as a uh, councillor and uh, mayor and uh, also the eventual mayor of the mega city. So I, th I hope we uh, include some kind of honoring of uh, uh, former mayor Mal Lastman. Yes, no, thank you for those comments uh, and we'll certainly take them under advisement. I think they're worthy of consideration. Okay, it's time to uh, go through the agenda. Um, we'll go through untimed items starting at 328. 1 Heathcote Avenue, Councillor Robinson. I'd like to move staff recommendations. Okay, staff recommendations moved on 1 Heathcote Avenue, part lot control exemption application, final report. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item uh, 32.9, um, to Champagne Drive, application to amend zoning bylaw. This is calling for community consultation. Uh, it is my, in my area. I will move the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item number 10, 3300 Dufferin Street, um, official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, Councillor Cole, now I understand that a community meeting has already taken place, so we can delete those recommendations before us, and there's a supplementary report that takes that into consideration. Is that, yes, is that your understanding? Can we uh, post the, let's see the supplementary report. Can we see it? Are you moving receipt, Councillor Cole? Well, I just want to see the report, the supplementary report. Councillor Cole, can you turn on your mic, please? Yes, I just want to see this. Oh, there it is. So, anyways, this is uh, just a uh, clarification uh, of the uh, public meeting that was held for 3300 uh, Dufferin, and uh, we already had the community meeting, and... Um, uh, this it was uh, a uh, sort of a bit of a bureaucratic uh, snafu, but anyways, uh, we're back on track now with this supplementary report and move receipt along with the report. Okay, uh, Councilor Cole is moving receipt. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item 3211, 
Series of addresses on Marley Avenue, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, preliminary report. It's asking for community consultation. Councillor Cole? Yes, uh, we'll uh, move uh, receipt of the uh, report here uh, to proceed. Move adopting staff recommendations? Yes. Okay, staff recommendations moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item number 12, 23 to 29, Grenbriar Road, official plan amendment, zoning amendment, rental housing demolition applications, preliminary report. Um, Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, I can move the staff recommendation to uh, hold a community consultation. Uh, there are some people listening in this area. Um, just to let them know, while I'm not moving a, a, a street address specific uh, um, uh, notice to set the boundaries of it, essentially it will be the areas uh, that are covered by Bayview Village Association, BSNA, and, and the immediately adjacent neighborhoods. But that can be worked out with staff without, uh, without having to be, uh, to be moved as a motion today. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, staff recommendations moved for a community consultation on 23 to 29 Greenbrier. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item number 13, accessible parking space, Thurston Road. Uh, Councillor Robinson. Yes, I'd like to move staff recommendations. Staff recommendations moved on item 13. Accessible parking space, Thurston Road. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item 14, naming of proposed private street and lane at 844 Don Mills Road. It's um, Deputy Mayor Minna Wong. Happy to move that. Okay, number 3214, moved by Deputy Mayor, naming a proposed private street and lane at 844 Don Mills Road. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item number 15, U-turn prohibition, Underhill Drive. Deputy Mayor Minna Wong. Wow, it's busy in my ward. Busy, I'll busy. I'll move that. Okay, U-turn prohibition. I have this much action. Yes. I guess I can't do my U-turns on Underhill anymore. Okay, all those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? That is carried. Item number 16, um, Van Horn Avenue driveway apron parking exemption request. Councillor Carroll? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that my uh, councillors will support me in uh, requesting a report on this. Uh, it's a very similar situation to what was happening on a strip of Shoreham Road. Um, and just uh, at the end of the previous term of council, we moved a similar prohibition. So I'm asking staff to report back on whether or not that is uh, applicable at Van Horn. Okay, it's a request for staff report. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item number 17, pedestrian crossing protection, Doris Avenue. Um, Councillor Fillion. I'll move uh, staff recommendations. Okay, staff recommendations move to authorize the installation of a traffic control signal on Doris Avenue. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. I'm gonna hold number 18 down for speaker. Traffic calming Lillian Street. Move over to item 193219, Assumption of Services Register Plan, Queen Magdalene Place, Levante Holdings. I can move the staff recommendations. Councillor Carroll is moving the staff recommendations. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item 20. Um, Residential demolition application, uh, 128, 130, and 132 Gorman Park and a series of addresses on Shepherd Avenue West. I will move um, option number three. 
uh, which includes approval of the demolition with conditions. So that's clearing the site, erection of a set, uh, a, a fence, and a series of other conditions. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item number 21, request to demolish non-residential building at 2204-2212 Eglinton Avenue West and 601 Caledonia Road. Uh, Councillor Cole, there's three options to choose from. Okay, I would just like to, uh, a quick clarification here. There's uh, obviously one with no conditions, then there's two with conditions. What's the difference between one and two conditions? All right, Councillor Cole, are these questions for staff? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, they're here. Yeah. They're here. Okay, if we can do it quickly, let's just do it now. If it's. Yeah, it's quick. It, okay. Through the chair. So the conditions for the beautification would be. There's just, a just pull your mic a little closer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There's two conditions um, that are similar that you're asking the difference of. One is for the standard conditions for the construction fence and debris, um, approve the demolition um, with those conditions. And then that is number uh, that is number two. Number one is the exact same conditions, except it adds on the requirement for a beautification agreement between the uh, city planning and the municipality and the, and the owner of the property. Uh, those, those beautification agreements cover the same requirements that are typically covered through a site plan approval. So if landscaping requirements, for example, so if there is an ongoing development, those are usually handled through site plan anyways. Okay, so uh, number one uh, uh, is basically adds the beautification aspect, right? Correct. Okay, I'll move number one then, the number one condition. Okay. With beautifications. Uh, all right, so Councillor Cole is uh, approving the demolition with conditions listed in number one on your report. Okay. Conditions A to F, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item 22, Vision Zero Safety Plan Speed Limit, I believe. Got it. Councillor Deputy. I gotta hold that. Yes, okay. Thanks. Thanks, James. There we go. Number 22 has been held. Uh, 23 will hold down for a speaker. It's also a timed item. I think we're done our non-timed items, so we go back to the top of the agenda for the 945s. First item is uh, 3021-2116 Eglinton Avenue West Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Final Report. We have four speakers on the item. Is Matthew Lang with us? And Matthew, are you the applicant? To the chair, one moment, please. Good morning, and yes. Uh, Matthew, are you on the line? Yes. Uh, are you the applicant? Yes. Okay. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Good morning, and thank you uh, for seeing us this morning. Uh, myself, Matthew Lang, development manager for the project, and Michael Gabrievich, uh, owner developer, is on as well. Um, we'd like to thank Councillor Cole and city staff for working with us on this project. Um, it's been uh, it's been a great process. Um, we're very excited about the project itself. Um, we think it's going to add uh, continue to grow along the Eglinton Crosstown, um, and it'll be a beautiful addition to the area. And we like to support the uh, recommendations that are in the report. And again, just like to thank Councillor Cole and city staff for working with us. Uh, thank you. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer. 
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Any questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, Michael Dubrovich? Good afternoon. Good morning, sorry. I think you can go. So, Shelby, you can go. We're in between speakers. No, but we're in between speakers. Yeah, but we're also, we don't, we technically don't have quiet. But we're in between speakers. It's, 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 tech, it's up to you. Well, there we go. Okay, we got quiet. Uh, Michael, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Okay, thanks for joining us. You have five minutes. I just, uh, just, um, just expand Matthew's comments. I just want to thank everyone for uh, helping, supporting us in this project, and adding more, uh, more units to the, uh, to the, um, to the stock in Toronto in terms of uh, residential units along Eglinton Avenue. And um, again, it's just uh, thank you for uh, for Councillor Cole for assisting us in this in this process. Again, it's been very. Uh, it's been very fluid and uh, and um, successful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions for the deputant? Oh, I don't see any. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Dong Hao Zeng. Mr. Zeng. To the chair, they were connected and left the meeting. Okay. Um, Shazad Varani? To the chair. Hello? There. Oh. Um. I'm here. Can you hear me, or uh, is this is this Mr. Verani? Yes. Okay. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Um, you know, I I just got a, a call from the 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 tenant. All three of the tenant. There are two residential tenant and one of the commercial tenant on the main floor, and uh, uh, they were telling me and showing me some pictures which was posted on the on this uh, 2116 Eglinton. I am the next door property owner, which is 2100 Eglinton. So they were concerned about that if, if the high rise, according to the uh, picture that they posted or something, it looked like is like attaching to our building and our residential tenants are concerned about that, uh, what they're going to block all the windows or uh, or so, so we were not sure what, what kind of construction taking place. And, uh, and the other thing I would like to mention is that uh, when, when I bought a uh, few years ago, there was a sign on the properties called two or three cars park, it's called Boulevard Parking. That sign is gone. And the right of way was the entrance. Uh, we shared the right of way. So now they, uh, the, uh, this new construction people, they put some kind of poles. So I, I need to see what exactly happened to um, uh, the Boulevard parking was assigned to us for years. I own this building, 2100 Eglinton, over 22 years now. So this is, that's all I was like to know some answers. And that's all. Okay, uh, thank you. Maybe your um, your questions will be answered uh, during questions for staff or in the speaking. Uh, are there any questions for staff on this item? Well, I just had a question of the last speaker. Oh, okay. Uh, Councillor Cole? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, have you contacted my office about this development in the past? No. Well, the, the sign has been up for a couple of years. Have you contacted anybody, the, planning uh, staff? Yeah, no, because I, I live about three hours away from Toronto, so I'm, I just recently uh, got that information. That, but you uh, own the property some... there? Is there the cannabis shop? Is that the one you own? 
No, I don't own that. That is the tenant who runs the business, but I own the building, yes. But the, the, you're talking about the cannabis uh, building there. Yes, yeah. So you uh, lease it to the cannabis shop? Yes. So is the cannabis owner complaining about the new building next door? Yes. And what is the cannabis uh, dealer complaining about? What, what they were complaining about is the same thing as one is that there was a boulevard parking, three or two or three cars boulevard parking, which was a sign. And the other thing they're saying that they, uh, if the building coming attached to this, that will block their um, signage and, and their customer or whatever. Because well, they, the they have a big cannabis uh, advertisement on the side of the building. Is that what they're worried about? That the cannabis won't yes, be yes. displayed on the side? Yes, and the parking. Okay, anyways, uh, I suggest that you call my office and we'll have you speak to the uh, planning department and uh, make sure that you're part of the site plan development, which will take place over the next... A uh, year or so, and we'll keep you informed. So please contact. We'll contact you uh, uh, and uh, give you the information you need. And uh, but uh, sorry, sir, I don't think we can do anything about uh, protecting your cannabis uh, display. Yeah, and what about that? Uh, the residential two apartment upstairs. Are you building something which blocks their windows? All right. Okay. Okay. So listen, he uh, this, this, this this person has had his chance to depute. This is questions for the deputant. Uh, it's going way beyond that. Anyways, just clearing something up. Yeah, no, un understood. Sir, if you'd like more details on, on, on for your questions, you must contact either the local council or the planning department to get those answers. And okay. I believe they've been working on the file for a couple of years. Okay. I'll Alrighty. Okay, thank you very yep. much. Questions for staff? To the chair, I apologize for the interruption. The previous speaker has reconnected. Oh, is this Mr. Zeng? Uh, we can promote them to a panelist now. Uh, Dong Ho Zeng? You hear him? Uh, Mr. Hey, Zeng? Good morning to everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Okay, sounds good. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, so I'm the owner uh, for the cannabis shop, right? So uh, my work is um, first would be the proposed building would actually block the windows on the side. And um, and uh, also the um, Chess, the owners of uh, 2100 Eglinton has mentioned the prior building um, uh, used to be built on the left-hand side was the um, maximum 10 foot tall, so it's not blocking the way of the 2100 um buildings. So that was one of my concerns. And the um, second one is also the boulevard parking, right? And um, uh, when we um, agreed to lease the um, place to operate as a cannabis shop, and uh, we've been told um, there is um, boulevard parking um, on the side of the building, which is um, uh, in front of the 2116 uh, Edlington Avenue. And uh, I think um, uh, right now, as you might be aware, the cannabis industry is becoming like, incredibly competitive in the GTA area. And I think um, you know, we try to do our best to survive in this competitive market, right? And the parking is one of the uh, things the customer is actually looking for, so uh, we try uh, we try to provide uh, that um, perks to our customers and to survive them in the communities. And also, we try to provide the um, great uh, cannabis the shopping experience the, to the neighborhood and try to educate the neighborhood about the legal cannabis and the, also the benefit of, of it. So I don't think. Um, like blocking, um, like blocking the signage of our stores and also limited the parking spot of our store will help the community go. Um, and uh, yeah, that's um, all my concerns. I just okay, had a question. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much uh, for those remarks. Questions for the deputant? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate uh, your concern about your business. Uh, the trouble is we have about 100 cannabis shops now in Eglinton West, so, uh, you know, uh, they're all struggling. Uh, but anyways, the, the question I had is, well, is it in your lease? I mean, that was where the boulevard parking was on the uh, west side of your building. Is that what you assume was there? Your uh, boulevard parking was on the west side of your building? Uh, yes. Now, did you realize that that was not uh, the... Uh, that was the property of this uh, new development site. It wasn't the property of your uh, building owner. Uh, yes, but um, but also the boulevard parking is supposed to belong to the city of Toronto, so it's um, not part of any. Um, it's not owned by the twenty one sixteen Eglin sense. No, I, I think we're going to have to clear this up with planning because uh, my understanding is that's private property uh, and it's owned by the uh, new owner of the proposed uh, residential development. So anyways, we can uh, verify that with you. Uh, and uh, uh, again, we'll have that cleared up uh, with the uh, planning staff. We'll talk to you about what the rules are and who owned the parking spots that you assume were yours, uh, et cetera. But again, as I said to the owner, I can't tell you that uh, we are going to be able to protect your cannabis sign on the side of the building, okay? Uh, I would say that is going to be very difficult when we're building an eight-story building on the side of your two-story building. Uh, so anyways, uh, call my office. We'll have you talk with uh, the planning department and uh, straighten out this whole issue about the presumed uh, boulevard parking you had, okay? So please contact my office. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Cole. Um, that ends the deputants on that item. Uh, questions for staff? We're still on 2116 Eglinton Avenue West. Oh, there yeah. Can I just ask a question of uh, planning staff or about uh, these presumed uh, boulevard parking spots? I mean, could you explain who owned those spots? Because my understanding is that that whole property was purchased by the present uh, applicant who's uh, proposing a residential development. Is planning available? Through the chair, I would um, actually suggest that uh, somebody from transportation services perhaps try to answer the the question about the boulevard parking. Yep. All right. Is someone from transportation available? Uh, through the chair, uh, good morning. It's uh, Luigi Nicolucci, uh, manager of development planning review for area two. Thank I can you. try and attempt to, to, to answer that question. So uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure where the location of the boulevard parking spaces are the subject uh, boulevard parking spaces. Um, generally speaking though, um, any boulevard parking spaces, uh, because they're on the city boulevard, they are um, they are licensed to the adjacent property owner normally, but uh, they are uh, they are basically on city property and therefore can be taken away at any time, um, subject to appropriate notice being given to the property owner that has the license for the boulevard parking spaces. Um, I'm not sure offhand what happened here if the owner uh, of the said spaces. Uh, just decided not to renew their license or 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 whatnot. Uh, I can look into that and provide some additional feedback. Um, but but generally speaking, the city has the right to remove those boulevard parking spaces at any time, provided they give proper notice. Yeah. They are in in a sense in a sense they are within the public right of way. So so they can be taken away at any time. Okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Nicolucci. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for staff on this item? Speakers? Councillor Cole? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think we can straighten out that boulevard party, but my long history with the air, this was an abandoned derelict 
parking lot on a main street across from a cemetery where we had nothing but trouble with trucks and uh, garbage piling up on this lot for 10 years. And I don't remember being any official boulevard parking there, so it's a welcome change for this abandoned derelict parking lot that uh, Mr. Chairman is now going to be uh, home uh, to people. Uh, and it's a mid-rise development, uh, which is a welcome uh, addition because as you know, we're seeing all kinds of applications for 30, 40, 50, 70 stories. Uh, this is a eight-story residential uh, development application, which is part of uh, the renewal of Eglinton Avenue. Uh, and uh, it's a welcome, uh, I can't say this, but all the 70 developments I have in my ward, but this one here is welcome because the owner has been very cooperative. He's kept with the uh, mid-rise guidelines. Uh, he's also making a contribution to the enhancement to the uh, York Beltline Park in behind, uh, and he's making a voluntary contribution to enhancing the connection between the park and Eglinton Avenue. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and the, you know, we, we got off track on a cannabis uh, store, and that's a legitimate business. The province of Ontario has given free reign for anybody to open up a cannabis shop anywhere in the city. And uh, believe me. Uh, we have more than enough cannabis shops in Eglinton Avenue. Uh, I don't know uh, how they can all make business, but everybody who uh, gives their 50,000 bucks can get a license. Uh, sadly, they don't realize there's another cannabis shop across the street and down the street and, uh, and all over the place. So I have sympathy for the owner of the cannabis shop. Uh, and uh, sorry that uh, we may have to block his uh, cannabis uh, billboard on the side of his building. But this is a much needed uh, residential development on a major subway line, the Eglinton Cross Town. This is within, uh, you know, 800 meters of a uh, subway station, two subway stations, one at uh, Caledonia and one at uh, Dufferin. So that's why it's a very good area. You don't need car access. You can have uh, walking distance and uh, but again, the applicant here has come up with a mid-rise residential development uh, that is very welcome in the area. We haven't had any opposition to it, which is really rare. I think we had one person uh, that, uh, no, not this one. We have no uh, objections to it, which is extremely unusual in this day and age uh, that people welcome the residential development. And they, they welcome it because it is an improvement of Eglinton, especially this part of Eglinton. Uh, which has, again, had some real challenges, but uh, this is a uh, wonderful uh, uh, addition and contribution to housing and at a moderate mid-level size, uh, and it's a, uh, an improvement for the area. So uh, I uh, totally support this application and hope we can get it built uh, quickly and uh, without delay, and that uh, we uh, welcome new residents here that can access the new subway and also access the new Beltline Park. So uh, I move uh, staff recommendations uh, on uh, uh, this uh, report for this uh, uh, development application, final report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole, and I hope you can work out uh, your cannabis uh, signage challenges uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, are there any other speakers on this item? Okay, staff recommendations have been moved. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item 32 3rd, 109 Erskine Avenue. We have deputants on the item. Is there a Andrew Ferencic? Hello? Uh, yes, Andrew? Are you the applicant? Yes, it's me. Are, are you the applicant? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. You have five minutes. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of committee. My name is Andrew Franchik. I am the principal of WND Associates. And we're retained as planners by the owner of the site. Um, I'm here in support of the final staff recommendations. Uh, we were very pleased to have worked well with staff to refine the application over the last couple of years. And we'd like to thank them and also Councilor Robinson and her office for a very collaborative and constructive application process. 
Um, this application will provide for the development of a new residential building that replaces all of the existing rental units that are on the site with new units, while also providing for 178 new market units. And this would be in an attractive terraced building form that will expand the Midtown Greenways concept along Erskine Avenue and help to improve the, the streetscape there with new landscaping and, and setbacks. Um, and this will be in a form that's compatible with the apartment neighborhood. And I'm here to speak to any comments that might arise. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any questions for the deputant? No? Okay, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Angela DeCarvalo? Carvalho? Can you hear me? Yes, Angela? Hello? Yes, thank Hello, you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Yes, um, there, uh, can I get uh, permission to share my screen as well? You have that now. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Angela. Uh, I am delivering these comments to you. They're being made on behalf of the residents of 260 to 278 Red Path Avenue regarding the 109 Erskine Avenue development application. Our homes are located along the southwest, southwest corner of Breath Path Avenue and Erskine Avenue and are directly adjacent to the east lot line of 109 Erskine Avenue. We believe this project as proposed has not been designed in, with public safety in mind. There is just enough, not enough space. For the format of this meeting, we will be showing you in short why that is. Further commentary can be found in the separate written communication online. Although these items are to be addressed at the site planning stage, we believe the safety concerns we have would push the proposed building envelope back and therefore affect the project in the zoning stage of the development application process. We first wanna to speak to the experience of this developer curated properties. Although they have developed other multi-residential buildings in the past, they have all been buildings at lower heights, most within more confined sites similar to 109 Erskine yes. Avenue. Based on their experience developing low rise buildings, Curated Properties decided this lot would be sufficient, but we find it is not for a 22-story building at a height at which they have never built before. As you can see from an aerial view, there is limited street access for 109 Erskine Avenue. There are neighboring properties sandwiching the property in from three or four sides. The only side which has street access is the narrowest side at approximately 30 meters. In close proximity to a pedestrian crossing, does this seem safe? For a larger building? We often wonder why this project would be allowed to proceed as other developments underway directly within the vicinity of our homes are all on corners with dual street access. You can see this in the aerial screenshot where all these developments have either been approved, completed, or in process of approval, passively maintaining safety with that dual street access. The only development highlighted that has been rejected is 241 Red Path Avenue which has similar circumstances in lot size and location to 109 Erskine Avenue, sandwiched in between other properties with limited street access and limited lot size. An added layer to safety concerns include the volume and variety of pedestrian vehicular traffic, which has fluctuated greatly from when a traffic study was last conducted. Now, in-person learning has returned, although school capacity issues persist. There's Hello, even more activity in the neighborhood Hello, Angela. Hello. Hi, I apologize for the interruption. Uh, you seem to be making references to images we should be able to see. Uh, we've given you sharing rights, but it doesn't look like you've chosen to share any images. Um, okay, I'm currently sharing my screen, it says, but... Um... So at the bottom of your WebEx panel, you should see the button that says share content. Now... Uh, okay, this, I'm this, sorry. No worries. Okay. Thank you. So... Um, would we have to reset the timer? I will turn that to the chair to decide. Thank you. Uh, is there any way that this can be circulated to the clerk and then to members? Um, it, it should have already. Yeah, I'm really not prepared to restart the, the presentation, but if the if you have, if those images can be shared in hard copy or yeah. online, we can certainly view them. They have already. Then we have them. Okay, Angela, you can proceed. You have about a minute left. Okay. 
Um, we'll proceed um, at this point. Um, not a layer to this, um, these safety concerns include the volume, variety of pedestrian vehicular traffic, which has fluctuated greatly from when a traffic study was last conducted. Now in-person learning has returned, although school capacity issues persist. There is even more activity in the neighborhood than ever before and pick up and drop off occurring on various points of Erskine Avenue, including at this pedestrian crossing right in front of 109 Erskine Avenue. Um, on any given weekday, there are parents in cars, cars parked on the streets, two-way traffic, backing up to multiple buses, not to mention now we have delivery couriers speeding around on unregulated e-scooters. This adds to the safety risk level when developing in this area. We are also concerned with lack of sufficient space to maintain access while meeting all parameters. As you can see, garage and exhaust was placed away from the townhomes to reduce noise levels to be able to make the units as big as the developer would like. No lane leads proposed along the east lot line and is now being removed for amenity and residential areas with no setback and additional balconies. Fire safety was assessed by the city on May 12, 2022. The assessment was loosely based on the ability of equipment to sufficiently reach the full extent of the elevation, as it currently has a laneway with signage indicating fire route access. However, it may not have accounted for the removal of this laneway in addition of the residential areas of the proposed units at ground level and a full base of balconies projecting into this area. In the event of accident or emergency, we find it unsafe and negligent if this equipment were being used directly above our homes along Red Path Avenue. And for our own safety, it, it's negligent to our own safety and the safety of the public. As, opposed, as proposed, the only way to access that elevation would be via Erskine Avenue. Is that enough to make sure residents along the east elevation are safe? We have found that any uh, that city guidelines and recommendations shown are correct in demonstrating the need for buildings to taper down to match the heights of any pre-existing neighboring buildings. It prevents direct contact in case of accident or emergency with any fire or debris from the tower down to adjacent buildings and pedestrians. Although this has been mentioned in the city planning report for this public meeting, this has not been upheld in the city planner's recommendation and there's only limited tapering of the building on the west elevation, none at all on the east. What we are proposing at minimum is a maintained laneway without obstruction between the townhomes and the east elevation of 109 Erskine Avenue and a tapering of the floors above down to the base building to avoid great impact of any debris falling our roofs or passers by along Red Path Avenue in the event of accident or fire. All right. Well, we, uh, Angela, you're done? We, we were most. Um, yes. You, you, I, I think you are. You're at, at six and a half minutes. So no, thank you very much for that. And we did see, we did start seeing uh, your diagrams and uh, images on the screen. They were quite impressive. Uh, are there are there any uh, questions for the deputant? No, I don't see any questions either in person or online. Angela, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm I'm sure uh, the local council will take it under advisement. Um, Andrea Butt. It's here. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. We have five minutes. Thank you so much. I would like to screen share I would like to screen share with Angela for the remainder of the slide portion of the presentation on behalf of Red Path Avenue townhouse residents. And note that written commentary has been formally submitted for your reference. In slide number eight, you can see 101 Erskine Avenue is an example of a development that's built successfully after 79 through 99 Erskine Avenue townhomes. There is currently a very wide laneway used only for vehicles servicing the building and in case of fire or emergency of at least 12 meters. In comparison, is substantially wider than the 109 Erskine is proposing at 5.5 meters setback from property line without any laneway, residential areas below at almost zero meter setback, and balconies projecting into the setback. On slide number nine, you can see in relation to privacy, the balconies proposed are creating privacy concerns where there is not so much about the projection of the balconies, but the number of increasing balconies, creating direct sight lines into private spaces with, operator, with operable windows and glazed doors, with approximately eight existing units worth of balconies, now proposed to be approximately 28 units worth. You can see on slide number 10, 
There has also been inaccuracies in how our properties have been represented. We are aware that showing this in the report is not a requirement. However, it is very misleading and portrays there being open space with sufficient privacy measures when in fact there is not. In the architectural drawings submit, our fences are being shown anywhere from between 2.3 to 3 meters high and they're closer to 1.8 meters high. Without our deck structure shown, only empty spaces. Some of our decks are in fact elevated a fair, a fair amount above grave, grade and are in much closer view to the proposed balconies. In slide number 11, per commentary in the most recently submit detailed revision list, the sight lines had been reduced. However, this is not due to revision to privacy screen, but due to how a person on a balcony was represented in the drawings. Previous drawing dated June 7th, 2021 showed a person standing or revision list shows them seated to make it seem like there's less visibility when the screening is in fact the same as shown above. Over the past few years, we have continued to participate and engage ourselves in the process of this development. This included a letter and submission of written commentary in relation to 109 Erskine Avenue's development application that have repeatedly outlined concerns that have not been resolved in city reports or developer, developer submitted resubmissions since. Council Robinson's February 28th, 2021 follow-up email correspondence to Redpath Avenue townhouse residents after the February 24th 2021 City Planners Community Consultation for 101 Erskine Avenue's development application also expressed concern and feasibility of the proposed project on this lot. There are complex issues why we believe that the development as proposed is not feasible, and they all relate back to, <clears throat> they all relate back to public safety. We are aware and accept that this area has been designated as an urban growth center. However, it is of utmost importance for pending projects within the community to be completed safely and properly. Given the proposed project would be so densely populated by new units spanning east and west elevations of 109 Erskine Avenue, noting the proximity to our backyard during construction with lack of adequate street access and the chaotic nature of the traffic along these streets. The way this development has been proposed raises serious safety concerns to both Redpath Avenue townhouses and surrounding community residents well after construction would be complete. It is also noted that in light of these repeatedly unaddressed concerns in both verbal and written communications, project approval creates undue exposure to risk and inevitable required legal pursuit pertaining to city addition as a responsible party de regarding developers ensure safety and property damage liability issues. Without moving the building face further away from the Eastline property, we do not believe that development as proposed maintains a safe and livable environment and is not beneficial to the community. It is apparent that the developer did not account for the complexity of executing a tower and a lot with a limited space in acquisition of 109 Erskine Avenue, and we should not have to pay for the negligence and irresponsibility. We ask on behalf of not only the Redpath Avenue townhouse residents, but also the surrounding community members to consider in its totality the ongoing and growing concerns regarding the development as proposed for 109 Erskine Avenue. Thank you. Thank you for the deputation. Any questions for the deputant? Councillor Carroll? Just, just one quick question, because I'm wondering how the community feels about this. Um, it, what you're asking, I, we'll, we'll hear from the community councillor and the planner later if, if it's possible, but, but if it were possible, um, we're really pushing on the family size units policy in, in terms of city planning. How many family size units can we get here? If, if the impact of what you're asking for moving back creates smaller units, um, is that an issue for the community or, or is, your, is your intention by pushing it back, you hope they'll create fewer units? Um, the pushing back is, is it's in relation specifically to the public uh, we're very, very concerned about their access on Erskine Avenue. Yeah. And our main concern is because all the other projects in the surrounding areas have the dual street access, we are extremely concerned for not only our safety, but the, uh, the, the surrounding community members, uh, given that it's a school zone, the traffic in the area. Our main issue is the lack of accessibility with respect to uh, being able to, uh, to, to uh, construct this project as is on this proposed lot size. I think that's the, big, the biggest concern and issue and how all of our points relate back to that. Okay, okay, thank yeah. you. Thanks for the, the okay, clarification. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll. Uh, any other questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor Robinson, do I see your hand going up or no? No. No, okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's all the deputants I have listed on this item. Are there questions for staff? 
Yeah, I have a question for staff. Yeah, uh, Councillor Robinson. Robinson. Thank yeah. you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I think so that we've just had two pretty impressive presentations by Angela and Andrea. Um, this is a very difficult application for the people living in the townhouses immediately abutting this development. Um, is there anything that we could do to assist those people living in those homes? And I guess my even bigger question is, um, tell me a little bit about the, um, you know, this being, this is zoned as apartments. And I think that makes the transition requirements different versus if it was zoned as neighborhoods. So can you just explain the zoning to all of us in that area? Through the chair, um, my name is Catherine Moore. I'm the senior planner on, <laughs> excuse me, the application. Um, just to count um, Robertson's point. Um, so just to count Robertson's points. Um, yeah, this, the adjacent neighborhood, um, the adjacent site at um, where the townhouses are located are an apartment neighborhoods designation as a, is this site. And uh, when the application first came in, the base building was proposed at six stories in height. And uh, as you'll see from the revised proposal, that has now been tapered in order to provide a more um, uh, a more appropriate transition to those those buildings at um, at the corner that we've just heard from from some of the residents. So now it's it goes from six to five to four stories for that the base building um, closest, and, and that relationship has been looked at through the course of this application, and and uh, we've had many communications, meetings, and, and uh, correspondence with the residents of those townhouses. Um, to the councillor's point about what can be done to um to improve that condition between the existing and the proposed building um through site plan as in addition to the measures shown on um on the proposed plans we'll be looking at additional screening measures that include fences of an appropriate height as well as trees that would prosper and grow given the conditions that they would be uh, planted within and and all of that can be discussed with the residents during the site plan stage Okay, so uh, basically, I think in this fact zoning, it's zoned an apartment neighborhood um, or its own neighborhood. And so the transition requirements are very different than maybe what would be in another another part of the community. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's designated apartment neighborhood. Typically, we would see a more dense development on the site. Townhouses typically are in neighborhood designations, um, which this is not. This is rec recognizing, you know, this is an, an urban growth center and this is quite a unique condition. So that is why there have been changes requested of the applicant in order to to provide that more adequate transition to the buildings. But but the, that, that site alone is, is actually a designated apartment neighborhoods um, and it, it, just, it wasn't developed upon um, through the course of this application. The applicant um, just acquired 109 Erskine. So, so yes, it's it is still being treated as the build, the the uh, relationship is still being treated as in the low rise building form, and that's that's why uh, the east side has had significant um, uh, additions and, and revisions on that side to ensure that it's more sensitively. Um, addressed than than um you know given that the, it's a four-story townhouse that exists right thank you very much no problem <clears throat> thank you uh councillor robinson uh any other uh questions for staff speakers and councillor robinson i believe you have a motion I, I do have a motion, um, Mr. Chair, uh, because you've heard from the residents today of the townhouses, and they are literally, you saw in the diagrams, immediately abutting this development. Um, I, I just, uh, I wanna see what we can do to address their concerns as best we can. Um, they have been continually engaged throughout the city's planning review process, as Catherine alluded to, and our office. On this application, it's been very impressive um, and uh, that's one of the most impressive presentations I've ever seen, um, certainly in my days as a city councillor. So I wanna start by thanking all the townhouse residents, uh, but particularly Angela and Andrea for their, uh, for their efforts and work and their presentation today. Uh, very well done. And it really outlined for council some of the challenges here. 
I'm moving two motions today um, because there still are a number of concerns with this application, as we've heard. And uh, these are the two motions. The first one is to improve the screening provided by the applicant on the Western property line to mitigate the overlook on the neighboring properties. So us would uh, like this situation in, in our neighborhood um, and uh, site plan will provide that opportunity with trees and screening as uh, the planner alluded to. Um, this is the planner did indicate um, that the residents can be actively involved in that process. Um, the other is to even further engage the local residents that, through a construction liaison committee. And so um, not just the developer, but the city, our office, my office, as well as the local residents um, be actively involved in the whole process to make sure their concerns are heard um, throughout this, this period. So um, this isn't the end of this application. Um, the developer must remain accountable to the community in the months ahead. And um, this, you know, Councillor Cole and I are dealing with this every day. The next, um, the next application is also mine in the Young Eglinton area, very controversial. Um, it's smaller, but this has having a mammoth impact on the residents in the townhouses like it's changing completely their their community and their neighborhood um and so that's why we want to make sure as this unfolds they're actively involved um and as i said the developers are coming in they're parachuting in these developments um we need them to respect the communities that we live in and especially when these smaller and you know, these smaller and existing are already in proximity. Um, we need developers to work with us on these issues. I mean, I could go on for hours about the problems at Young and Eglinton, uh, the Midtown area, and how it's imploded overnight. Um, it seems like overnight, but it's been years in the making. The number of applications in the pipeline, um, it's, it's phenomenal, and we don't uh, get a chance to express that enough. There is huge pressure on the development uh, of Young and Eglinton. And um, I keep talking about the need for park land and green space in the area. I've talked about it for years, way before it was even identified as a deficit. But that's why Red Path Parkette, which is right in this neighborhood, it needs to be expanded. To anyone listening from city staff, planners, park staff, transportation, we need to secure more land around Red Path Park to park at to make that enhance the streetscape and make it bigger uh, and to make the area more livable. So every chance I get, I talk about open space and streetscape master plans and how we need to make this come to fruition. Um, we need to expand that park period now and um, city staff need to play a role in making that happen um, and securing more land around us. So uh, on that note, I would like to move these two motions um, and I want to thank again the, the incredible residents and their participation and engagement on this issue. Phenomenal. Um, and we're going to continue to work together. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Was that a standing ovation? I could do that. Oh. Um, thank, thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Are there any other speakers on the item before we move the motion? Okay. Councillor Cole? I can't miss the opportunity to support Councillor Robinson and her heroic fight to get some sanity in uh, Midtown there. Uh, and if I could uh, get uh, the site map up of uh, around 109 Erskine, I know Councillor Shelley Carroll has a frightening uh, map on her screen uh, that I think should be displayed as we talk about this. I mean, I thought it was Shanghai when I looked at it. I asked her and she said, no, it's Midtown. So can we get that up on the screen? 109 Erskine Avenue, uh, Apple Maps. It reinforces what Councillor, uh, what Councillor Robinson is saying is there is a tsunami of development applications. 
and this is not even up to date. We have applications coming in for 60, 70, 80 stories on a regular basis. And we, here it is, Shanghai on Young, right there. So, I mean, I, uh, a, a picture's worth a thousand words, they say in Shanghai. But anyways, uh, this is what's happening, and this is her side. I mean, I complain about the hyper develop, uh, development on my side, uh, where we've got them coming in on a daily basis. Because as you know, uh, I don't know, people don't know that the provincial rules have been changed uh, overnight uh, with Bill 108, uh, 109, uh, with the uh, MTSAs, which means that there are no height restrictions as if you're within 800 meters of a subway station. So there's no height density restrictions. That's the new provincial rules. Sadly, it's not even uh, an issue in the provincial election, but anyways, uh, so I totally support what Councillor uh, Robinson is trying to do here in protecting the residents from this flood of uh, developments which are ruining their light, their uh, air, their uh, ability to even uh, see the sun, uh, whether they'll ever see the sun again in Midtown. That would be an interesting, we'll have to bring in an artificial light uh, or something in there in the future. Uh, and I know in North York you think it's bad. Well, come down to Midtown, Chairman uh, Pastor Nag. I ask you to walk with Councillor Robinson and I, see if you can find a blade of grass that's left in Midtown. There is no grass left, there's no air, there's no sun left. And this is what is happening on a weekly basis, new applications, no limits, no controls. It's like the Wild West on steroids uh, in Midtown. So. Again, I support whatever efforts Councillor Robinson and the community is trying to undertake in uh, saving some sanity in these development applications uh, in uh, Midtown uh, and uh, trying to make uh, the area livable for the people. And then the worst thing about it, as Councillor Robinson knows, we have a group of development trolls that go on all of our public meetings trying to tell the people in Midtown you're not building enough and you're anti-development, you're anti-housing. Every public meeting they come on and say, the people in Midtown are all NIMBYs, they're against housing. And uh, I said, have you ever walked in Midtown? Have you ever seen this map of Shanghai on steroids, the young Leggington? They obviously have not. So they keep insulting people who have uh, done more than accept housing and intensification uh, and they tell them, well, you haven't, you're not doing enough. You're, you're standing in the way of housing. Well, I said, take a look at Midtown. Tell me that the people of Midtown are not uh, supportive of housing and uh, renewal, et cetera. I think we've done more than our part in Midtown and continue to do it. Uh, and it's just the, as I said, the overdevelopment the, without any public services, without parks, without libraries, with zero public infrastructure. This is not the way to build a city or plan a city, and certainly uh, not for the people who live and uh, try to work in Midtown. So I support what Councillor uh, Robinson's motions, uh, the intent of it. Thank you. Yikes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cole. I would be happy to, uh, to come on um, uh, a ghost walk, I guess, in Midtown. Uh, uh, Haunted Walk of Toronto, one of those series, uh, to enjoy the neighborhood and we'll look together for some sunlight. Uh, are there any other speakers on the item? No. Okay, so we have the motions, Councilor Robinson's motion, if we can put them on the screen. Okay. Moved by Councilor Robinson, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. The item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Next item is item 323, 355, 357, Roehampton Avenue, zoning bylaw amendment application final report. Uh, we have deputants. Um, I'm looking for a Randall Dickey, who I assume is the applicant. Mr. Dickey, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. 
Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of North York Community Council and staff as well. Um, my name is Randall Dickey. Um, I'm the president of Urban Growth, Inc. We are the registered owner, or not the owner, applicant and planning consultant for 355 and 357 Roehampton. Um, this proposal is for a small infill on Roehampton of a four-story apartment building with 14 units. Let's try and adjust this a little bit more. Um, I have on the overhead projector here, I've just highlighted the subject site, and it is two properties on Roehampton being consolidated. Immediately to the east, for some context, there is a condo townhouse on the east side. On the west side, there is a semi-detached along Roehampton. There's also an apartment building. This is a three, four-story apartment building. And then, of course, you have the, uh, the high-rise apartment buildings fronting onto Eglinton. This is a simplified site plan of the proposal, proposing a four-story dwelling. Um, I would just like to note that over the last two years since we filed this application, we've been working very uh, collaboratively with staff and the counselor, and I would like to thank both of them. Um, there was also a community consultation meeting um, where a number of comments were made. So as a result of those discussions over the last uh, two years, there's been a number of changes to the plan. And I would just like to quickly point them out. The overall height has been reduced by four feet from the original proposal. The westerly side lot line, oh, perhaps I could, uh, it doesn't, so this site plan is shown to the side, but to the west, um, the side yard set back here has been increased from three feet to six feet. Um, there are 14 parking spaces provided in the rear of the property. This is in full compliance with the city's requirements for tenant parking, visitor parking, accessible parking, bicycle storage spaces, they've all been provided in full compliance with the current uh, criteria of the city. Um, although not required, we have also added outdoor amenity space um, for the residents of the building, as well as a pet relief area, um, all within the back area of, of the proposal. There was also a number of changes made to the overall design of the building. Uh, that came through requests from either staff or from uh, through the counselor's office that we have made. Um, there are no windows on the sides of the building. Um, there are wall projections at the rear dealing with balconies to reduce the amount of overlook onto abutting residential properties. And the entire roof line was redesigned. It was originally, it was a flat roof uh, with a slightly more bulky mass. Uh, that was changed as well to a mansard and sloped and slightly less uh, mass proposal. All these changes came as a result of discussion and dialogue with, uh, with staff and the councillor. And I believe this application is actually a very good example of good planning um, for an infill development in the City of Toronto. This proposal complies with the City of Toronto official plan. It complies with many of the development guidelines that we're all dealing with. Um, and it provides all the required parking on site. And again, as I said, tenant, visitor, accessible, bicycle, uh, even a charging station. Um, I note that there's a city planning staff report dated April the 19th of 2022 which is a very good and comprehensive report. Um, I would just note a few of the statements made in that report, which uh, I would uh, state that this proposal is an appropriate level of intensification on Roehampton. It is compatible with the surrounding context, and it's an overall, it's an improvement for the community. Um, so I think this proposal is a very good example of how infill development can occur uh, in dialogue with city staff and the residents. Uh, this allows for intensification, but and yet at the same time, I think it truly reflects 
the uh, objectives of the city in their official plan and their various development documents. So with that, I would again just ask that um, city, uh, this community council recommend, uh, adopt the staff recommendations, and I would be pleased to try to address any other questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Are there any questions for the deputant? No, I don't see any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Doyle Brown. Do we have Mr. Brown with us or online? Hello, this is the host of Doyle Brown. It looks like your camera is on. Are you able to speak? I, it looks like you are speaking, but we cannot hear you. No, we still cannot hear you. If you've selected the correct input mic. Um, can we go on to Carol Joy Betts Patterson and then come back to Mr. Brown when we've got his uh, connectivity issue solved? Yes, to the chair we can. Uh, Carol is also connected and unmuted. Carol, if you can say a few words, please. Um, yes, I'm not very familiar with this um, format. I haven't been able to see this, um, what the screen was showing, but uh, Randall Dickey sounds uh, very reasonable and I approve of this development as a neighbor. Um, I put up a couple of requests um, and that is uh, how necessary is the parking lot at the back? Um, in terms of, I'd like to preserve a huge magnolia tree as a possible recreational center and could I share um, the screen? Um, let's see. I don't know if I could come up with a picture. I guess you'll have to imagine it. To Carol, <laughs> uh, if you have an image to share, you can do so now. Okay, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Um, um, here. Because my screen is full and I can't see the... Um, the, the video I have. I'm sorry. It's a gorgeous, huge pink tree, but only for a few days in the spring. The rest of the time it fills. It's directly behind the house on the west. And it, so it's in the middle of the western property. Uh, so there is space on the left. On Sorry, not the left. The east side uh, for a driveway, but if we could preserve this huge tree, not much, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have jet lag too. Um, as Toronto residents, we should all be proud of our city's reputation as likely having the world's most trees per capita. And it's, it's truly impressive. And at 355, this huge magnolia tree is slated for demolition, like it fills the lot um, from east to west in the middle and it would make a lovely uh, recreational area with the green cover. Um, it's, um, uh, trees provide so much oxygen for us, de devouring carbon dioxide and other toxins and backyard trees are seldom protected from being chopped down, unlike the safe city trees at the front of properties. So I would like to suggest that the development be allowed if it's a maximum of four stories, um, but having a center grassy courtyard containing this magnificent tree, um, because uh, we do need, it sounds as though he does need a driveway for the cars to park at the back, but I'm hoping there's room for a center courtyard to keep this amazing amazing uh, tree. I don't know how old it is, but the owner of the house, Lee Knox, who sold it to the developer, was always worried about this tree. Um, it's not diseased. 
you know, I'm not an arginist, but it looks incredibly healthy. Um, it's the size of the trunks are like there's multiple trunks, uh, four of them, I believe, each the size of a giant tree. It spreads out beautifully, and that's what magnolias do. Uh, the other thing is there's only one multiple resident development on this long section of Rohampton Avenue between Rawlinson and Bayview. And this one development is four stories high and blends it beautifully. And I did have a picture of it, which I'll, <laughs> I wish I could share. Um, it's in an Edwardian style copied from a house a few doors down that is um, literally Edwardian. And I request, request that this proposed development, if allowed, be restricted to, um, you know, trying to be, stay in keeping with the two and three story houses on this length of street. It's very different uh, from the, um, the, the horrible section of Shanghai um, between Mount Pleasant and Young on Rawlinson. And um, I totally agree with Ms. Carvalho on, Carvalho on how invasive these towers are. Uh, we have had our views of sunset cut off simply by a, a nine story building on the, uh, in this area. Never mind the 50 story buildings, it's, it's atrocious. As we've all worried about what's gonna happen when everybody flushes their toilet at the same time at Young and Eglinton. <laughs> and Roehampton and Eglinton. Um, this is a different section and people do ha have to come over here to see Eddie Green, to uh, walk their dogs and to uh, reach a park, which is way over at Roehampton and Bayview. If you so could, Eddie yeah, Green, you're, you're closing in on five minutes. If you could wrap up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, basically that's um, my request. Um, I'm very glad that the developer um, is cooperating, and I wondered if he could comment on the feasibility of keeping the tree in a little courtyard. Okay, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, are there any questions for the deputant? Question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Councillor. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Robinson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, so it, there's two private trees proposed for removal and seven preserved. So Carol, I'm just wondering designated or identified to be taken down, the Magnolia? Um, well, the developer might know, but I'm pretty sure. I don't speak anymore. The, the, the speak. Oh, sorry. I love so you. You, you read the <laughs> OK that it was being demolished that particular tree I may be mistaken but I believe that it has to be demolished yes the, I... oh I guess yeah it doesn't matter if it's existing okay you know what Carol I'll ask city staff mm -hmm. the question and, okay um, but thank you for your um, thank you for your advocacy on the tree that's wonderful okay thanks great I, thank is you is there it okay Thank you, thank you. I just uh, wanted Council to Thank you, yeah, Councillor Robinson. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the deputant? I don't see any. Okay, uh, Ms. Patterson, thank you very much. Uh, can we go back okay. to Doyle Brown? Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, Mr. Brown? Yeah. Okay, um, you have five minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So thank you uh, for allowing me to speak today. I'm a resident that lives at 355 Roehampton Avenue. It's the proposed development to the west of this, this building. I've lived there for 12 years with my wife, uh, my 11-year-old twins, and their nine-year-old brother. I've uh, shared concerns in previous meetings and I just wanted to provide two comments today. Uh, first, I would acknowledge the developer has made some changes, but we still have two primary concerns. One being the aggressive footprint and the density of 14 units replacing 
two current dwellings, which is inconsistent with recent developments on Roehampton. For example, at 417 to, to 435 Roehampton, uh, 28 units are replacing eight current dwellings. So again, I think having eight bachelor units and six one bedroom units is very aggressive for a very small footprint. So our second concern is around the time of the construction. Um, really trying to understand what the site approval and management plan would be. And we're more concerned around this existing development on Roehampton, it's Seville on the Row towns. There's, as I said, they'll be building 28 units and this has been in the works for a number of years. So I would just ask for consideration that if this proposal goes forward, that as after this larger development. And the reason I share this is two semi-detached homes were recently renovated. And just with two units being renovated, it was very difficult and challenging with the trades and different vehicles and things coming. So I think if there's two sites this large at the same time, it will be very difficult for residents of the street. But those are all my comments. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Pariza Afkami. Pariza? Hello? Yes, hello. Hi, how are you? Um, welcome. Uh, you have five minutes. You are connected. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I want to thank city staff for giving me the time to comment on this project. My name is Paris Afkami. I'm an architectural designer working at IBI Group for more than 10 years. And uh, I've been working on the residential section for the past 15 years in Toronto. And uh, we live across the street from this project. Uh, and this project is just in front of our, our windows, actually. And um, I think this project is not uh, beneficial to the community. It has, um, um, and it's not designed with neighborhood uh, current issues in mind. It has capacity issue, privacy issue. And when I check the um, zoning interactive map, this, um, this area, uh, is in our zone and um, the actually um, number of units of each land is two. So if they, they are combining two uh, lots, uh, they can build like four units in this um, in these two lots um, with the FSI of um, 0 0.6. But they are proposing 14 units with the FSI of 1.4. Um, which is very, very aggressive uh, for this neighborhood. And the height in this, um, in our zone, in this area is 10 meters. They're proposing 12 meters, which is creating shadow uh, on, uh, on the street and in, on, our on our property. And uh, it has privacy issues. It blocks our uh, view. Um, currently, uh, there are beautiful uh, trees on this property. and. Um, when I checked that, uh, when I checked at uh, their site plan, uh, they are removing uh, these old um, trees which um, are across this street, and um, they are proposing. I guess um, I didn't see any chart in their site plan, but I think they are proposing less than 50% of the landscape in the front yard, which um, I guess is really important for the city of Toronto and for the neighborhood and for people like us who are living just across the street. And um, I know that they're proposing 14 parking spaces, but two of them is visitor parking. Based on my experience, maybe I'm mistaken. I didn't have time to go through all the details, but uh, usually uh, the ratio of the parking is one per unit in this area. And then we have to add the visitor parking um, ratio to this. And so basically they are proposing 12 par residential parkings, 
which uh, you know we have uh, many many parking issues in this area many of the um, existing residents of Rohan of Rohanton Avenue don't have parking spot and we have to walk um, a long distance to get to our car right now if they build this um, project with um, 12 parking spaces um, I know that we will have parking issues in, in this street, especially we can only park on one side of the street. And um, I didn't see any waste management area I, or any loading area because I know it's a, a rental building. So they, they will have a lot of moving and move out um, times. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to manage that for the loading and for the waste um, area. Um, and also... Um, I think um, they are making this street overcrowded and uh, I totally agree with the councillor um, about um, his concerns about this area, uh, Young and Eglinton. And this is a very quiet uh, neighborhood. Uh, we purchased this property. This was our only investment. We are a young couple. I recently gave birth to my um, seven week old uh, daughter and I'm really worried about her safety if they um, develop this property here, because uh, right now, um, as you know, the lots in this area are, are not that huge. So we have like very small backyard, very small front yard, and our children are gonna play in these um, small spaces. If they build um, such a huge development um, here in this uh, area, then they create shadow on our front yard and, um, you know, it's not really safe. And um, I saw that half of the uh, front line will be um, just entrance uh, to the um, vehicular entrance to the property. So it's more mostly the driveway in the front yard and they're removing beautiful trees and replacing it with uh, driveways. And um, when they talk about the townhouse complex next to this property, it's two and a half story townhouses. It's not really that dense. And uh, they have a set. Marisa, if you could, uh, if you could wrap up, you're over five minutes. Sure. Please. Sure. The townhouses have a setback at the third uh, floor, and I guess I guess this project is very uh, very over uh, aggressive, and um, I hope the city can save and protect the residents of Midtown. Um, and um, I mean, I know that we will have sun and air issues and the capacity issues. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for your uh, comments. Any questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That ends the deputants on this item. Uh, questions for staff? I would like to ask. Um, yes, oh, uh, Yes, Councillor Robinson, sorry. Questions for staff. Thank you. That's okay. I, 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 you know, we've been intimately involved in this development, so um, I don't have a lot of questions for staff because the residents also have been very engaged. But uh, the first thing, uh, that's the first I've heard about the magnolia tree. Um, so I wanted to ask staff if that tree could be preserved given its beauty in the neighborhood. I don't know whether that's a question for planning or for forestry. I could answer that question through the chair. Good morning, councillor and members of council. My name is Eno Dorok, the senior planner assigned to the file. On page 20 of the report, it states that the existing seven neighboring trees are to be preserved and protected during construction. So yes, the tree in question is to be preserved. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I just want to clarify, all efforts will be made and it will be preserved. The magnolia tree that we heard from uh, Carol Patterson today. Yes, but we can also take it back because we don't have um, a member a staff from urban forestry present today so we can also take that back and double check and make sure that um, we are correct in our response that it is to be preserved thank you 
Thank you very much. That's all, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, any other questions for the deputant? Oh, sorry, we're on questions for staff. Any other questions for city staff? Speakers? And I understand, Councillor Robinson, you have a motion. I do. Thank you very much. Again, as I alluded to in my last remarks when I was talking about the former development, again, controversial. Uh, this is a smaller development, but big impact on Roehampton and the immediate neighbours, as you've heard. And again, uh, thank you to the community who have remained very engaged throughout the entire process. Uh, they've never really bowed out. They've continued to be active from day one on this. Um, and it's, it, it, is, um, it is difficult um, when these things are happening, when it happens on your street or near your home, you would feel the same way. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased with their involvement and even to, today. Um, and we had a great community consultation meeting on this um, way back on this application and we heard significant concerns raised by uh, quite a few residents potential impacts uh, this development would have on many, many issues, especially for the immediate neighbours. But most of the feedback we got from uh, neighbours on the street was about the on-street parking on Roehampton Avenue. Um, and to address this issue, I'm actually moving to exempt the subject property from uh, permit parking. So that is the motion uh, the clerks have. Um, if, I don't know if they need to put it on the screen. There it is. Yeah, it's um, on the screen. But um, thank you very much. So we want to make sure transportation realigns the parking uh, permit system on Roehampton Avenue to exclude the development address located at 355 to 357 Roehampton Avenue. Uh, this is this is not uh, this is very important because there's such issues on the street already. We're, we're really struggling in this area. So um, this is a motion that we, we need to move today. Um, and also, I'm, you know, you heard it from Doyle. Um, and thank you to Doyle and, and Parisa for your comments today. A very eloquent representation of your neighborhood. Um, but people are very worried about the construction and how it will be managed. I also ask staff to take uh, careful consideration of um, the local residents and their, take into account their concerns about, you know, how we best mitigate the impacts of the construction time throughout uh, this period, but also with a construction management plan. If staff could please um, develop a fulsome, um, holistic construction management plan. So, I, you know, I also want to specifically thank Heather and Doyle Brown uh, for your engagement and your thoughtful feedback throughout the process of this application. Um, and at that, I will leave it, Mr. Uh, Chair, and hand it back to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Robinson. Are there any other speakers on the item? No. So we have the one motion, if we can put it on the screen. Great. There it is. All those in favor? And, and then the item. Oh, yes. Okay. And then the item is amended. Oh, all those in favor? Opposed? And the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Um, Mr. Chairman, I can dispose of an item quickly, I think. Uh, we, yeah, we're happy to take a quick release. See, there are no deputants on the item. This is um, a reduction of speed limits in my ward and Ward 8. Um, I, have a, I have an amendment to the um, recommendations in the report. Uh, Staff you, have the, have yeah. the motion. Could you, Staff just, have the motion the could you remind me of the yeah. item number? 22. Okay, be happy to do a quick release. If we could put the motion on the screen. So this is just a motion as it relates to my ward. Um, I would like to know how this 30 kilometer speed limit is gonna be enforced, especially within the context of my office 
just being informed that the traffic unit that is responsible for my ward and Ward 16, in other words, quite frankly, has just been disbanded. Um, so uh, my constituents just essentially, you can't have a speed limit unless it's enforced. And when they're less, when you can't get service, that becomes a big problem. So I, I'd like the police, Toronto Police, to come before North York Community Council and explain how they're going to enforce the 30 kilometer speed limit. That is all. Okay. So, okay. So that's not that's not a question for today's debate. That is for the future, right? No. This is homework for you, uh, Mr. Chair. You've got to contact uh, Toronto Police Services and get them to come to Community Council to tell us how they're going to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm always looking for uh, extra extra work to fill a little bit of the few minutes I have between three and four in the morning when I'm taking a break <laughs> from watching uh, reruns of Grey's Anatomy. Uh, anyway, I understand Councillor Robinson also has a motion on this. Is that correct, Councillor Robinson? No, I don't. I, I, you, you do not. It. Okay. So if that's the yeah. case, then I'd be happy to, unless there are any other speakers on the item. Uh, yes, sure. Mr. Chair, I just want to speak to this briefly because I have a crystal ball and I can predict right now what people are going to say in the whole of, of, uh, of council when, when, if this goes there. Oh, that's that one individual counselor and he just wants to continue to drive his car fast. And I'm here to tell you that I, I spoke with the Deputy Mayor Min and Wong this morning and I 150% support this motion because I can tell you right now that the minute you bring forward the Vision Zero uh, item for Ward 17, which is the very next, it's on the list of the report is upcoming, my residents will say the same thing. Sounds nice. How are you going to enforce that? And and Councillor or Deputy Mayor Minna Wong has discovered that the answer is, we don't know. We're disbanding our traffic unit in this area. So I 100% support this motion, and, and I, I want to be on the record as such. I think we should record this vote because I, I want Council of Whole to not start in with, with snide remarks. This is a serious issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can put, uh, unless there's any other speakers? No. We can put um, Deputy Mayor Minna Wong's motion on the screen, and uh, Councilor Carroll has asked for a recorded vote. So uh, I assume it's the recorded vote on the motion or the item? On the motion. On the motion, okay. I want them to know I supported it. Okay, uh, so here we go. Um, let's see who we got on, on line here. Okay, all those in favor? Deputy Mayor Ren and Wong, Councillor Fillion, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Cole, and Councillor Pasternak, it's unanimous. Thank and you. The one more vote. Uh, the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. So that was a quick release. And now we have to go back to uh, item number uh, 32 6, 30, 3377 Bayview Avenue. We have a lot of deputants on this item. Now, I understand the applicant is marquee development, so we usually have the applicant go first. Um, Jennifer Kiesmat, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. And you have five minutes. I think AV is coming to help there. Loaded, loaded, that would be great. Okay, so let's start the share. Oops. Sorry, I just need to, it's on my screen top there. Oh, I see it's shared right there. It's going into system preferences. Okay, yeah, do it. Okay. Um. If you just want to click on this, yeah, it's going to ask for your password. Okay, just take 
click on that. Okay. Oh, jeez. Oh. Because it, ha because it wants to record it, so I have to go out and come in again? Mm, no, for now we can pause it. Well, the issue with the time, okay, I'm going to uh, right. So what should I do? Okay, yeah, I guess you'll, you'll have to. Okay, can you help me through yep, this quickly course. a minute? Okay. Okay, we're in business here. This is good news. There was just a little glitch. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keesmat. You have five minutes. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here to present you a proposal that we've been working on for over two years with city staff and the community in a number of community meetings. And I'll just like to begin by introducing Marquee Developments because you may be unfamiliar with our company. We are focused on building affordable rental housing in urban locations with an emphasis on sustainability. And we're very much created as a company in response to the housing crisis, in particular for middle income earners. And you can see here on the housing spectrum, the focus of Marquee Developments is on both affordable rental housing and market rental housing. But we seek in every project to maximize the amount of affordable housing that we can provide. Our model is incredibly unique and allows us to prioritize and invest in heritage repair and preservation. And you'll see that in our proposal on 3377 uh, Bayview Avenue. We can prioritize sustainable development, secure the financial future of not-for-profit organizations, deliver housing that is affordable in perpetuity, so no time limit on the affordability in our housing, and also deliver an unprecedented amount of affordable housing in any development. And on Tyndale Green, that's 50% of all the homes that are proposed to be affordable in perpetuity. Tyndale Green is a development that is a partnership with Tyndale University. Tyndale is a seminary that exists on the site, purchased the site from the Sisters of St. Joseph's, and they occupy the Mother House, which is a building that we have focused on because it is a really critical heritage building in the city of Toronto, and it will remain, and Tyndale will remain uh, a critical part of the community moving forward. There are a series of key city building moves. 1,530 new affordable rental homes, 50% of which will be affordable. Significant heritage retention, interpretive elements, particularly of the mother house, but also cultural heritage and heritage views have been respected. A new community daycare, a new community recreation facility, more than 34 acres of new publicly accessible green space on land that is currently privately held. Two new public parks, 2.9 acres worth, and a restorative landscape and improved community access to the ravine. You know, it's been interesting to sit here and see the other proposals, and in particular to hear Councillor Cole's comments on, you know, the building of Shanghai. And in part, it's very interesting because what we're doing here is something quite different, as you can see. This is about building a complete community 
in North York. And there are 15 new buildings that we're proposing on this 56 acre site. It's an absolutely uh, astronomical amount of land. And of those buildings, the vast majority of them are all of them except for two are below eight stories. And that's for a really critical reason, because we want to create a walkable, livable community on this site. The two taller buildings, which are 15 stories and 20 stories, are located in the low point of the grade. The site actually drops away from Bayview Avenue. And to the north of this site, there's a series over seven or eight of uh, tall buildings that are uh, uh, north of the site and provide a, a tall building context. You can see here that this is a shared vision between Marquis and Tyndale, but we've been working very closely with the community because it is a significant amount of, of new uh, development, but it is providing a really profound new community amenity. And I'd just like to walk through some of the drivers for change for Tyndale. The first is acting on Tyndale's principle of stewardship from a cultural, built, and natural heritage perspective. I'll just like to uh, point out to you point number four here. The objective is to fully integrate the university community with its urban context to their mutual benefit. Some of the key design principles are about heritage, community building, timeless materials that link into and draw on the character of the existing built form. What does this look like? You can see here on this rendering of the primary built form typology, raising from, uh, ranging from four to eight stories on the site. In the next slide, you can see the walkable character of the site and the, how the heritage and the, the uh, ravine landscape is being drawn through the project. Here you can see the retention of a critical heritage component on the site that has been integrated to become a new community amenity. A site like this is very challenging because it has a whole series of constraints, which are also opportunities. There are grading challenges. There's a mature tree canopy. And we went through the entire site and we analyzed hundreds and hundreds of trees to ensure that our site design is respecting and enhancing that tree canopy. We're also concerned about shadows. And one of the reasons for the low built form that you see on this site is because we wanted to mitigate shadows, less so on the adjacent community because it's really too far away to be impacted, but impacting the shadows in, on our own site and our own community. And uh, with your indulgence, Chair, I'll just spend one minute on this last slide, if that's okay. Thank you very much. All right, You're, yeah, if you could uh, wrap up, that'd be great. So you can see here, and this is a really important slide because we often zoom in on the built form, that 100% of the land, 34 acres, that is below the top of bank. So the property boundary is the red area that you see on the site plan. The yellow line is the top of bank that we mapped with the TRCA and we've collaborated very closely with the TRCA. The buildable area on the site are the green areas that you see, which are primarily surface parking lots, a tennis court, and an old track that was built in the 70s and has been uh, unused for many years. And what you can see here in the center of the site is the heritage building that remains. And you can see that the built form, which is being added in the overall site plan, which I'm just going to throw up in front of you quickly, uh, primarily adds buildings on those surface parking lots by putting all of the parking on the site below grade. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Are there any questions for the deputant? No, no questions. Uh, it would be great. I don't think the clerk has a copy of the presentation. I think councillors would, would very much like a copy of it. Yes, and I'll just add that there are, uh, through you, Chair, there are quite a few additional slides, but I've packaged them up as a PDF. Uh, slides that obviously there wasn't time to present today. Yeah, there's only so much you can do in five minutes. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us. It's nice to see you again. Uh, Christiana Chen. To the chair, one moment, please. Do you want to take, oh, okay. take it from there? So we're back at the top. Go ahead. 
You want to sit yeah. here? Okay. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Jim Donigan. I'm uh, Christina's uh, husband. Christina had to step away a little bit. Um, she should be back in 20 minutes or so. But I'm actually next to speak, so I'm wondering if, if I could go in her place for now. Sure. Good morning, Jim. It's, it's Councillor Carroll. I'm just taking the chair for a second while, uh, while the chair takes a break. But uh, uh, it's a matter of just timing and speaking right now. So I can start the clock again, and, and you have five minutes. You can speak on Christina's behalf. Well, this will be under my behalf, but Christina will be coming, coming back uh, probably in 20 minutes or so. Are, are you registered to speak as well? Oh, I see you are, Jim. That's okay. Okay, so we'll take your five, and then hopefully she'll be back by then. Thanks. Go That's ahead. That's great. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm a resident within the Bayview Woods neighborhood, and I oppose the proposed development at 3377 Bayview. Um, I'd first like to thank city planning staff for their review and assessment of Markey's development application at the site. As a member of the working group, we appreciate that you heard many of our concerns and feedback, and we thank you for listening to us. I would also like to express my disappointment at Marquis development application. I'm surprised at the quantity and breadth of non-compliances that this application had against the city's official plan. Given that one of Marquis' principles is our former chief planner, I would have expected a more sincere application. I have many concerns about this development, but I am most passionate about its heritage preservation. I've been a resident in the community for all of my adult life. I went to Bray Buff College and St. Joseph Morrow Park, which was located at the Tyndale University site, was our sister school. I was one of hundreds who stood outside the gates of the property, waiting for Pope John Paul II's arrival for World Youth Day celebrations in 2001. We were thrilled when he arrived and made his way around the grounds to give us his blessing. The Pope's stay at 3377 Bayview was a historic event for the city and for the country. This site has been a community landmark for over six decades. It is a rare example of a site which meets all the criteria for heritage designation under the Ontario Heritage Act, having exceptional historic design and contextual value. Four neighborhood associations have nominated this site for heritage designation with endorsements from the North York Historical Society and the North York Preservation Panel. Not even the developer argues that this site should not be a heritage property. Markey commissioned a heritage impact assessment for the site. Unfortunately, the report's recommendations were disconnected from the facts presented in the report they commissioned. Despite claiming that the former high school at the site has architectural merit and heritage value, the de developer plans to destroy the school to make way for more apartment towers. The TDSB has said there is a shortage of high school space in our neighborhood, meaning new residents at this development will need to be bused to schools outside of our district. Why not preserve the school so the neighborhood has additional capacity? Further, in Markey's Heritage Impact Assessment, they claim that their design preserves the landscape views and remains subordinate to the existing mother house. However, the existing mother house ranges in height from three to four stories. The 14 apartment towers proposed by Marquis at the site range from six to 20 stories tall, many of which are placed directly in front of the existing buildings, essentially blocking them from view. In what way is Marquis design subordinate? Marquis insincere approach to heritage preservation underscores the need for the city to redouble its efforts to ensure that the site has the required protections before the case is heard at the OLT. It is for this reason that we request North York Community Council to advise the Toronto Preservation Board 
and city and Toronto City Council that it supports the following three initiatives. First, the designation of this property and Tyndale University as a cultural heritage landscape under the Ontario Heritage Act, a designation supported by renowned heritage architect, Chris Borgel, who has studied cultural heritage landscapes in several Ontario municipalities for over 45 years. Second, the initiation of a planning study to assess and recommend appropriate zoning amendments to protect this heritage property and ensure its preservation as a cultural heritage landscape. And third, the adoption of a Section 38 interim control bylaw to permit this study to proceed. Great cities protect their landmarks. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, Jim. Um, Councillors, are there any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, is, uh, is Christina available to speak at this time? I think she'll be, be available in about 10 or 15 minutes, Councillor. Oh, okay. So we're going to go through a few speakers and, and, uh, and then come back. Thanks very much. Okay. So the next speaker on the list is Dr. Ryan Cyrus. Would he be connecting by phone? To the chair, one moment, please. Good morning, I'm available. Is that Dr. Cyrus? Good morning, I am available, yes. Good morning, okay, I'm gonna start your clock. You have five minutes, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ryan Cyrus, I'm uh, on executive on um, Bayview Commer Neighborhood Association. Also an architect. Um, most of my professional work has been um, over 20 years of experience on condos and developments. Um, I have uh, nothing against developments. This is what I do. Um, but uh, with uh, all respect to all uh, professionals involved uh, in this uh, proposal, uh, we are talking about uh, land that is sitting between um, residential detached uh, houses on a very quiet, um, low-rise, like all two two-story houses um, area, um, and we are talking about twenty-story apartment buildings sitting beside. Um, houses, residential houses that have been like, it's a, it's a very special neighborhood. It's not like Midtown, it's not like downtown. It's very quiet, all two-story houses. Um, and now we're talking about 14, 15 um, towers, just like a mini city sitting beside two-story houses. Um, and this land does not sit on a subway line or a major intersection. It's along Bayview. And my uh, question is, if this pro proposal was to go ahead that this much, like it, it's, it's completely out of character. Now, if this proposal was to go ahead, what stops uh, all other uh, lands this, like all churches, like um, synagogues. Um, next step would be probably TDSB parking lots. Uh, everyone else wants to build a, a development like this um, among um, detached houses. That, that completely changes the whole um, character of North York area and probably the rest of the city. Thank you. That's it from me. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cyrus. Okay, is, is Loretta Murphy with us? They're online, one moment, Chair. Loretta? Hello. 
Hi, is that Loretta Murphy? Hi, this is Loretta. Can you hear me? Hello? Is that is Loretta Murphy on the line? Can you hear me? Hi, Loretta. We're having real trouble hearing you. We heard you initially, but it sounds like you're further away from your mic now. Can you hear me now? No, it's very quiet. No, we, it's still very quiet. Uh, to the chair, we'll attempt to troubleshoot with the current speaker if we'd like to move to the next one, please. Okay, super. Um, Harriet Altman is the next speaker. She'll be by phone, I think. Harriet, you're now unmuted. Hi, Harriet. Can you hear me? We can. Harriet, it's, uh, it's Shelly on the line. I'm just sitting in for the chair for a couple of minutes. Um, so I'll, I can start Perfect. the clock for you, and you have five minutes. Okay. I have a, n a number of concerns. Most passionate. Oh. Uh, I'm about to start. Uh, the Toronto Region Conservation. Harriet, Harriet, if I can just interrupt you for one second, you have to stay real close to the mic. We heard you real clearly, but then you sort of faded. Can you get real close to your microphone? To the chair, one moment, please. Um, the problem might be on our end rather than on the speakers. Oh. Hello? Oh. Hi, Harriet. We've, we've stopped your mic. We're just having a little bit of audio difficulty, but I've stopped your time. We j just need a minute to solve it. Hello, Harriet. Can you say a few more words, please? No, we're still having trouble hearing you. One moment, please. We have some in-person applicants. Shall I, you want me to proceed with the in-person? No. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Okay. Are we? One good? minute. Is this any better? It is. Okay, okay. I'm going to start so your clock start over again? again, Harriet. There you go. Okay. Um, okay, I'm Harriet Altman. I'm the secretary of the Baby Valley Rate Pairs Association, and I have been for approximately 40 years. We have some very grave concerns. Number one, we certainly favor development. And we certainly favor affordable housing. Our, the, the thing that I am most passionate about is the Toronto Region Conservation Area Authority. We live in the middle of a forest. There's always been a rule that the ten, first 10 meters from the stable top of bank were like gold, you couldn't touch them. Then there was a three meter easement for the, uh, for the city. Now, going into this area with two high buildings, Are you, Harriet, you, you, you went silent there at the end of the sentence about the stable top of bank. Are you still there? Can you hear me? Uh, we, we, you made, you made uh, your point about the, uh, the stable top of bank, 
and then you went okay, silent. Can you, can you pick it up from there? Stable top of bank and the 10 meter setback that's required by T TRCA. There's a three meter municipal easement for that. Now, that usually that's carved in stone. However, it's even more important to here. Um, there is so much land that they don't have to put high buildings there. Um, the stable top is vulnerable. We all know about erosion, saving the planet, keeping it green. We're going to lose a lot of two. There's, there is so much heritage in this property. This is, as far as I know, the only place in probably all of Canada where a saint has stayed. Um, after po the Pope visited, he died and he was shortly canonized. To rip it down or any part of it is sacrilegious. Um, it's not like they need every foot. Now, I personally am in favor of affordable housing. It's the definition scares me a little bit. The definition is apparently mo not more than the going rate. And I'd like to be able to help people if we're giving $56 million in subsidies. As well, um, I think that people in affordable housing deserve the same standards as everybody else. The, uh, I'd like all the roads to be public roads so that they meet the same quality as you and I have. We'd like the TCC to go through there, just like they go through York University and um, U of T. And we're trying to help the most disenfranchised people in, in society. Um, there are people who are handicapped. I know that I was in an accident and I'm walking with a cane now. It would be a shame for me to have to use wheel trans because the, the bus was out in Bayview. If it was near... Sorry, you're cutting out again, Harriet. Harriet? Harriet, we, we, we're not able to hear you right now. Hello? Hi, we, we lost you. You, you, uh, you made your point about uh, the uh, um, wheel trans being available and the Bayview bus being available, and then you went silent. I paused your time. Um, okay. But I, Are you earlier I reset it, so you have about one minute left. So I'm going to start your Are, clock again. First of all, I'd like to know if there's going to be handicapped units. And this is a family neighbor. It doesn't make sense that there are so many bachelors and one bedrooms. What we need are two and three bedrooms because we need families. And I, I support everything that that Jim said. I think he was very eloquent and right on point. And the, my other concern is, while I don't, I fear, I'm in favor of, a, of the bus lane you might need later. I'm in favor of the bicycle lane you might need, but I am 100% against losing traffic. So I think we need further setbacks and I don't want to block the beautiful view of, uh, that's there now. And we've brought these forward and I'd like to thank staff for as much input as they've given us on this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Harriet. You came in right on time. I had to reset the clock at one point, but, uh, 
Uh, you came in very well at, well, at, at five sure minutes. Thank you. I'm sure that it wasn't as eloquent in pieces. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Good to hear from you. Okay. Um, to the chair. Yes. We believe we've connected the previous speaker. Oh, okay. Should we Loretta try again? Murphy. Loretta? Okay. Uh, Loretta Murphy, are you there? Hi there. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry about the difficulty earlier. We think it was at our end. I'm going to start your clock now, and you have five minutes. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the staff and counselors for putting this meeting together and for hearing our concerns. I think that many residents in this area are completely overwhelmed by the sheer volume of development being proposed in North York. And it's important for us to have our voices heard and our concerns validated since the changes being proposed have the potential to impact our day-to-day -day lives. Simply put, the development proposed for the Tyndale property at 3377 Bayview does not represent an improvement to the area since it is over development for this community. This area does not support the proposed density. If we compare it, for example, to the new units being proposed at Young and Steeles on sites that already have commercial buildings on them, there's at least public transit infrastructure in place there. Here on Bayview, we do not have a public transit infrastructure in place to support this type of massive development. And while I'm on the subject of infrastructure, let's not forget the power grid. Just over the weekend, many people in North York suffered a lengthy power outage due to the storm that blew through. Power outages are already a recurring problem in North York, considering that we are supposedly in a world premier city. So we need to assess and update the power grid infra infrastructure, not to mention sanitation and water supply and even internet and phone lines before even considering adding the density proposed with the, 30, the 3377 Bayview project, not to mention all the other neighboring proposals. And still on the topic of density and infrastructure, the fact that there is a school existing on the property uh, that is just going to be torn down doesn't make sense when there are so many local schools in, at capacity. And we know that there are local schools that have to have portables and already have limited spaces and resources to expand but with the increased population that would occur with this proposed overdevelopment, in addition to the other nearby proposals, where are the kids going to go to school? Um, there's also a summer camp that operates out of the school on the Tyndale Green property, and it fills a very important need in the summer by providing summer camps, which is childcare for hundreds of kids from ages four to 12. It will be a great loss for the community if we lose that service because it is already difficult for parents to find local summer camp spots for their kids. I know there's a daycare being proposed for the Tyndale Green Project and that is much needed, but it is just filling one gap while opening up others. Uh, that may be a provincial issue and not a municipal one, but as a parent, it is still of great concern to myself as it must be to other families. And Speaking of families, the proposed development does lack larger units for families. There are many single units, but I'm not sure if that actually solves the affordability issue for families, uh, if in fact the, definition, the city's definition of affordable housing is actually being met with this proposal. We've heard uh, councillors Robinson and Cole speaking this morning, and we now have the opportunity to avoid a Shanghai on Bayview and in North York. Let's please act proactively now rather than regretfully later. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Okay, um, thank you, Loretta, for those points. I've been making notes as fast as I could. Um, the next speaker I have is uh, Tom Kohler. To the chair, that speaker is not present. Oh, okay. Is Frank Morrow present? Ah, there he is. Good morning, Mr. Morrow. 
Oh, okay. Ah, okay. We we hadn't uh, we hadn't met yet. I knew you were registered to speak to this. Um, uh, I have uh, five minutes for the presentation, but uh, I'll also let councillors know in case you're referring to it. We also have your attachment. Your attachment, uh, the letter that you sent, is is with the item in councillors' agenda on the portal. So I'll give you five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Dominic Conforti. I'm here on behalf of Mr. Morrow. Uh, Mr. Morrow is here in, in uh, two capacities. He's a resident at 69 Bowen Court. And Mr. Morrow was also the developer of Bowen Court under Bowen Investments, Inc. Um, the issues we bring to date are, are a fewfold. Uh, firstly, uh, during the development, Mr. Morrow was asked to provide for a future road connection which is uh, block 62 on the uh, M plan that is shown. <clears throat> uh, presently, block 62 is also being used as part of the parquet uh, for the area. Uh, within that development agreement that Mr. Morrow signed, there was a provision where that was gonna be a future road and it was supposed to be used specifically for a future road. There was never any consideration provided to the developer for providing that road. And, and secondly, there was a, a shortfall in parkland where the developer contributed a quarter million dollars to provide for uh, community space elsewhere. Um, the other concerns we have is when we reviewed the reports, there is no specific uh, mention of what's gonna happen to that roadway. There's no connection. And of concern at the time of the development that was brought to the developers was the city was adamant that they needed an emergency access route. As you can appreciate what happened this weekend, if there's a catastrophe, trees falling at the intersection, that's, that's the only life left, that's left for the community. Nobody can get in and out. There's 60 homes on that street. Mm -hmm. So our question is, has the traffic been looked at from all perspectives, which we believe has not, because we haven't seen this being addressed or even commented on. Um, so that, that is a concern. So with respect to, the, to whether there is a need for it or not a need for it, Ultimately, if there is no need for it, then Mr. Morrow and the developer, Bo Investments Inc., would like to see that reverted back to the developer, and we just make a point of it. Uh, with respect to the development, we, uh, we heard this morning about Shanghai Young and Eglinton with a subway. This is Shanghai Bathurst, uh, Bayview and Steels without a subway. <laughs> we can appreciate when everybody talks about the property, it's a vast piece of land, but most of the development is occurring on less than half the land. And uh, it's great that there's an affordability component here, which we appreciate. Uh, again, sometimes with affordability, we, we tend to disregard the need for cars for people that live in affordable housing too. They're ultimately gonna have to drive. And then everybody worries about the infrastructure later, about you know either the LRT or the subway or what have you. So that is, uh, as far as the residents are concerned and the ratepayers, we, we share the same concerns and uh, that's the extent of our, our, our submission. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if I can ask you a couple of questions because uh, when I read your letter, that, that, that was news to me. Planning, as it turns out, I spoke with them this morning and they had reviewed this, this issue, but uh, until, until the submission, I wasn't aware. So I'm wondering, I'm probably putting you on the spot, uh, but is it, was it clear to the community that this, uh, that Block 62 was being held for that possible future purpose back at the time that the community would have gone through the, the well, process it, to create Bowen Court? It was under the subdivision agreement, which is registered on title for all the properties. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there was some awareness in the community. There was, yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered because I, I, you know, having read the letter, it will now become a part of the conversation. So I, I wondered, uh, did, will it be the first time they've ever heard of it, but no, not for the Bowen Court residents? It was part of the sales. Uh, sales plan, yeah. It was on our site plan. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, that, that covers my questions then. Uh, Councillors, are there any other questions? Seeing none, um, that, that is it, thank you. And I'm gonna pass the gavel back to the chair. Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll, for taking over. Um, Carl Rond. Carl? Hi, Carl. This is the host. We had just unmuted you, but it looks like you muted yourself. Uh, we are unmuting you again. If you can say a few words, please. This is the host to Hello. Carl Braun. Oh, yep, speaking. Thank uh, you. Carl? Hello? Yep. Yes, okay, Carl, welcome. You have five minutes. Okay, um, I'm just wondering if I can. Uh... Okay, I got five minutes, I got nine points to make. That's 30 seconds a point. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity here. Um, at the very top, I thought it was uh, somewhat I oxy, uh, a bit of an oxymoron or whatever you want to call it, that um, there was a reference to um, indigenous land, uh, this being originally. And when it comes to land development, that's just, just that's uh, kind of uh, why I even bring it up. Next thing is, um, seems, uh, uh, okay, approximately 90 healthy trees up in the upper part there where they're talking about developing these these buildings um it is um it is uh, i went there I, I i took the the proposed building uh, layout and i just uh, you know like uh, urban development 101 and I, I overlaid it on top of my google uh, maps uh, of the same property and lo and behold having a quick walk around um, by the way, I grew up. This was my playground when I was uh, when I was a kid and everything. You know, so anyway, just one. I had names for these trees when I was young, and um, I I just walked around. And I went, oh my God, they're talking about cutting down. Forget the lower one third of the property. That's not touchable anyway. It's all it's all a floodplain. So don't boast any uh, kind of uh, adherence to uh, or, you know um, environmental uh, concerns by, by saying that that's going to be left alone. It's the upper trees in the upper area that they're going to destroy, especially the six in the lower Southeast corner There's a bit of a building there. And instead of destroying the parking lot that exists and putting a building there, they're going to take down from what I see, six beautiful old growth willow trees in Willowdale. My gosh, is that ever responsible? So that was one. Okay, let's 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 just be respectful. Okay, you're you're free to debut. Yeah, I am. I am. I, I I'm being respectful because I'm speaking for these plants. I'm speaking for these trees. I'm speaking for the for the historical value of open green space in Willowdale. That's really what what's going on. So if that's okay, um, that's something that I think um, is is, uh, is 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 something that's worthy of mention. And I appreciate the warning. However, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I grew up on Argonne. Argonne was the first parcel of land sold uh, from, uh, from, from the sisters uh, there and the development back in the late 60s. And then there was a 99-year lease that was actually signed with St. Joe's that was going to promise that there was no more development for the remainder of the property, which was in our, um, our, back, uh, our backyard. So um, all of a sudden, the next road there, what's it called? Uh, the next road there to the south of the property here? Bowman? Bowman, is it? Bowman Court? All of a sudden, they, they raised. One morning, we woke up, and all the green space there was raised. And and many of the, 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 the um, ladies that lived on the, on the north side of Argonne passed away within seven or eight years. Um, of them destroying that property and the knowledge that they were going to be developing Bowman Avenue, Bowman Court, um, on that land that was promised that would never be touched for 99 years. So that's another little interesting uh, tidbit of this of this property. Um, there's uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Anyone could help me with that? Uh, yes, you, you have about a minute and a half. Okay, I appreciate that. Now, um, the other thing is, uh, the, um, basically... Uh, or irreversible environmental damage is just that. So don't cut these trees down, save these darn trees. We don't need huge high rises in this property. And the other thing is, as far as an application for religious uh, based uh, tax exemptions, when you are not even including anybody on the lower spectrum of, the, of society, from which I would think that a religious based organization would be probably focused on, that 
they're not even they're not even offering anything and I'm unfortunately on uh, subsidy and and I was looking forward to being invited to the party I'm not even invited to the party and this is my old backyard and I actually live there and I'm looking for a place come June 1st and I have no hope I'm left out in the door just so the developers can understand Astro astronomical amounts of land I think you better sit down um, to the developers quite frankly because the people in this community don't need to hustle to get this development passed and I think that's about wraps it up because those were words from my grade 11 A.Y. Jackson urban development planning notebook that I just found on Friday when I put my name to register for this meeting isn't that coincident so there you go folks I scrap it let's have a retake on this one and preserve the lead green space we have in Willowdale especially those six green so those six willow trees there in the southeast right, quadrant Thank you very much, okay. uh, Carl. Uh, are there any questions for the deputant? Bring it to me. I think I made my points very clear. I'm, yes, I'm, no, thank you, Carl. Uh, there are no questions. All right, cheers. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Bye, Basha. Key Kazravi. To the chair, that speaker is not present. Paul Cheng. Pauline Cheng. To the chair, one moment, please. Okay. Hi. My name is Sylvester Chong. I'm the husband of Pauline Chong. Uh, Pauline, unfortunately, has a sore throat. So I'm just speaking on her behalf. All right. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, you have yeah, five minutes. Thank, thank you. Um, I personally understand the need for growth and accommodation of others. Um, you know, I've been in business, I've been a doctor, and I understand affordable housing. I don't think the community is against affordable housing, but Doing the affordable housing has to be on proper grounds with proper zoning, with proper ruling and not affecting what is in the historical value of the heritage site and also providing the proper access and proper way to deal with the affordable housing rather than just a profit for the developers. Um, first of all, I do understand Harriet's concern about uh, TLCA. I've done developments and TLCA is somebody that rules should not be bent for any form of fashion. I also understand the Bowen Street have flooding already previously and with the climate changes, there's gonna be more flooding. So to place uh, buildings in the flooding area where the TLCA designates should not be buildings is not good for the, whether it's a building or for the people living there, whether it's affordable or non-affordable housing. So I think that should be respected. To have high rise in the area, I think there's not the infrastructure that's built for the area. They have not done the proper traffic study. And what they have shown a traffic study from the time of COVID when there's no cars running there. Uh, so the traffic study has to be done properly and they have to have access, like uh, Harriet said, that can go into the area where these affordable housings are. Thirdly, the historical value of the place should be preserved. So you should not have like 20 story high rises. It's okay to have mid or low rises, which would allow the affordable housing. I don't even have objection if the whole place is affordable housing, just to give the whole affordable housing the place to be. And it should be more than just a single bedroom. So it should be also have two bedrooms and also for the students as well for the Tyndale area and not just for the, uh, whatever the developer like to have. I think for those reasons, I think the whole plan has to be totally relooked at and rechecked because you know, the placement of the buildings are wrong. The way the traffic is wrong, the flooding is wrong. Um, there's so many wrong with this development, which to me looks like it just for the developer's sake and not for the community and for sustainable future and doesn't truly look after the people in the area 
as well as the historical value of the site. So I do believe then this uh, this project, the way it is, cannot go through, has to be totally redone, and has to be more input from the community and to come up with a proper plan. And the best way to do it is to put the whole thing on hold. The planning city council has the power to pass the interim holding bylaw, which will allow enough time to redo and relook at the whole community situation and how this place should be developed properly for the affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, any questions for the deputant? No. And uh, councillors, we are coming up to a lunchtime. Um, it's a pretty big agenda today, and I do apologize for those uh, waiting around for some of the uh, fence exemptions and other items that were time for 10 o'clock. Um, obviously, it's not. It's well past 10 o'clock, and this item is, is taking a while. Um, I'll go on the suggestion of, of committee members. Um, I guess we'll take a regular lunch break. It would be it would be nice to finish these deputations, but they will not be done in the next nine minutes. Uh, so these the, the balance of the deputants, we can do probably two more, and then we'll break for lunch. Is that the will of committee? Yes. I'm I'm okay with that. And uh, our remote. I don't know about the yeah. They're we'll eating at home. They're eating already. All right, well. So two more? So why don't we do, uh, why don't we do two more? Um, Actually, the Dr. Turk is saying one more. No. Oh. okay. Um, is there a doc? My, I don't mind varying the procedure. I only have one sitting there. It's a Dominique Conforti. Uh, he has spoken while you were you were out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that is it, Mr. I, Sobel? That's here in yeah. person. Yes, he was the late registrant. Why don't we hear from him and then, and then? Yeah, I see him on the list here. He's not marked as in person. Jay, Jay Sobel. Very much. Yeah. And there's another person in person. No, just the one. Um, I, your name is? Oh, it's Mark. Mark Richardson, of course. Full tummies. Okay, so testing, we've, got, testing. Uh, we've got Jay here. So thank you for coming. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you to North York Community Council for providing a forum to express concerns over the current proposal by Marquee Developments for Tyndale Green at 3377 Bayview Avenue. Why should you listen to me? My name is Jay Sobel. I have lived in Bayview Woods for 38 of the past 55 years, from 67 through 89, and again from 2006 to present day 2022. I've seen a lot of change in my neighborhood since Bayview Avenue north of Shepherd was an oil dirt road with single lanes in each direction. I graduated from the University of Toronto in 82 with an honors bachelor of science degree in human biology. I graduated a second time with distinction from the Faculty of Engineering and Design at Carleton University in 88. I have been a professional member of the Association of Chartered Industrial Designers of Ontario for over 20 years. My first significant job in design was with Park and Architects Limited. After my tenure in architectural design, I went on to spend over 30 years in high-tech product development in the telecom, defense, healthcare, and consumer product industries. Common to all of these industries is that design development adhered to the stage gate process of project management. This well-documented process exists to mitigate the risk of failure and to enhance the probability of success in design development. Since hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars are typically at stake, and since people's health and welfare and occasionally, indeed, uh, the quality of their lives may be at stake, shortcuts in the defined process are ill-advised and simply not tolerated. As an industrial designer, I am responsible for representing the needs and concerns of end users 
within design development teams. This human-centric approach to problem solving and respect for the established processes of design and project management is well proven and has led to a personal portfolio of 29 patents and 34 design-related awards. For the past decade, I have been active as an industrial design consultant and part-time design educator. For the past six years, I have taught human factors at Sheridan College. Human factors, for those of you who aren't familiar with the field, is the study of relationships between people and people, people and products and services, and people in their environment. It is as an accomplished design professional, specialist in human factors, and longtime resident of Bayview Woods that I voice my disapproval and objection to the current proposal for Tyndale Green. I wish to offer an uber abbreviated critique of Tyndale Green from the perspectives of human factors in design. With respect to relationships between people and people, the proposed density of residents is inappropriate for the actual small footprint upon which the sum total of buildings, 16, can apparently actually safely be built. As COVID-19 has proven to everyone, Infectious diseases spread rapidly between high numbers of people in close proximity to each other. You know, I worked for the city of North York Department of Public Health when I graduated from the University of Toronto doing public health education and promotion. I cannot find a family doctor accepting new patients in Bayview Woods and vicinity for myself, my wife, and my seven-year-old child. Where will the proposed number of inhabitants go for health care? And do you really expect them to bicycle to Thornhill in the winter? I understand there's an initiative to reduce Bayview Avenue back to two lanes again, exacerbating the current bottleneck during rush hours. Elected government officials are supposed to represent the concerns of taxpaying constituents, not lobbyists. The politics surrounding Tyndale Green, the premature termination of working groups that we heard this morning, and the failure to follow traditional municipal planning processes and to fast track the approval of said project is a source of concerns. The optics are simply not flattering and serve as fodder for speculation. With respect to relationships between people and products and services, this past winter in January, we received a downfall of snow that was so sudden and severe it caused seven TTC buses and three Markham regional buses to jackknife on the slope between Steeles and Cummer, just above, opposite, and below 3377 Bayview Avenue. Traffic was detoured and at a standstill for days. With climate change, we're told we can expect similar extremes of weather in the future. Markham told their bus within two days, the TTC buses were still there for another four. This caused a traffic nightmare for residents and commuters from as far away as Aurora. Can you imagine with laneway reduction on Bayview how it will affect all of the proposed inhabitants of Tyndale Green seeking to enter and exit their compound, especially with you current could, challenges uh, for existing you could residents? Wrap up. Please. Too many buildings, too large, too close, too unsightly from the street. If any of this, if any of my design students propose this as a thesis project, I'd send them back to revise it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Questions for the deputy, Councillor Carroll? Yes, I, I ask this only because I, I know you're currently doing a lot of talking in the community. You're a candidate in the provincial election. Are you aware that there is no proposal to reduce the lanes in Bayview. Uh, this is just what I hear. Yes. Well, I'm afraid that what you're hearing is is a, a really bad case of neighborhood broken telephone. There is no proposal to reduce the number of, of lanes in Bayview Avenue. Well, I know a lot of people that would be very happy to hear that. Thank you. I, I'm sure they would. And anyone who reads my e-blast already knows that. Uh, Rapid TO had a, a consultation in which they showed a theoretical map of avenues in North York and asked uh, residents which ones they thought would be great candidates for HOV uh, lanes, bus only lanes. And uh, it was quite clear from that consultation, North York wide, that, that Bayview was not people's favorite candidate for that street. And no such proposal has been made. Well, uh, like I said, I mean, I'll, I'll be able to spread that message because there's a lot of people that don't have that understanding. So thank you very much. Shelley well, Carol. that's a shame. I hope that people uh, uh, spreading that rumor will stop spreading that rumor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll. Are there any other questions for the deputant? There are not. Okay, so uh, we're we're pretty well at the lunch hour. Once again, I do apologize. 
uh, to those members of the public that wanted to depute on a series of fence exemptions uh, uh, that uh, I guess from items 23 to 28, uh, they were timed for 10 a.m. and obviously we didn't make it. So we will get to them eventually, I assure you. We will, we will hear all the deputants and cover all the items today, uh, but we're adjourned uh, till 1.30. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Is there an for for the um, fence exemptions or mine? Is there an approximate time we could tell people because they've been working since 10 a.m. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I have one here. Um, I, I see, I see my residents. Yeah, my residents been sitting here for for hours, and I appreciate her patience. And once again, I apologize. Um, I'm guessing, Councillor Carroll's guess is around two. Um, I, I don't I don't know if we're taking bets here, but I, I would say yeah, between two and three. Okay. Can I re, can I release uh, an item? We, we, we've already adjourned. The clerk. Uh, are, yeah, power down. All right, we'll release it as soon as we come as soon as we come back. We will release it, Councillor Cole.
Remote counselors, if you could turn your camera on, we're just trying to get quorum to restart. To the chair, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We, uh, when we uh, broke for lunch, we were at NY 32.6, 3377 Bayview Avenue. We were listening to uh, deputations. Uh, the next one I have on my list, I believe, is a Dr. Howard Price. Dr. Price. To the chair, one moment, please. And Councillor Cole, you mentioned you had a quick release. So yeah. we'll listen to, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll listen to Dr. Price if he's on the line right now. To the chair, that speaker is not present. Not present, okay. Um, Councillor Cole, you have a, a quick release. Which item is that? Yeah, that's the item I brought forward. Uh, parking changes to Glen Park Avenue. Get that uh, clarification of the parking sign there on Glen Park. Oh, that was the uh, walk-on item, I'd the like new item? To, uh, okay, uh, that's fine. We can put it on the screen and vote on it. Ellie, your mic's on. Okay, we're just, uh, this item, as I said, was just about uh, clarifying some confusion where people are getting tickets when they're going for their fish and their coffee on Dufferin. So uh, we got to let people shop local. All right, any other speakers on this item? No? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Uh, Councillor Carroll, I understand you have a quick release as well. A fence item with no deputations? I, I do. Uh, we, we, you know, made a site visit and checked with the owners. They're not planning on making a uh, deputation. So it, if you want, I can release it. Uh, which which number is it? racing to log on so I can get to the number. It's number three, Clorinda. Thank you. Item nine. Yeah. 29. 20. Yes. Application. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so, uh, any speakers on the item? Any questions for staff? No? Uh, Councillor Carroll, you have moved. Um, uh, you have yeah, moved, if, I could, if I could just speak briefly, I'm, I'm going to be moving the, the alternate recommendations, recommendation number two, which I, everyone will probably fall off their chair because that is very unusual for me. But it is a similar frustration to one we had a couple of months ago uh, with the, in, in uh, Deputy Mayor Minna Wong's ward in that um, they started out with uh, uh, seven concerns from uh, inspectors, met five of them, tried to meet seven of them, but different inspectors coming at each subsequent visit and where we've ended up I made a site visit, and I'm comfortable new, moving number two at this point, having looked at the outside fence and the, and the fence that has now moved away from the door of the house, et cetera. Um, and especially since that second condition does say that if, ever, if there's ever any uh, 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 you know, structural deficiency and it's time to replace the fence, that, it would be, that the matter would be revisited and corrected at that time. And those are my comments. Great. Okay. So um, item 29, uh, Councillor Carroll has moving um, number two, option number two, granting the application. Um, any other speakers on the item? Any questions for the mover? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Any other quick items? 
I, I have a couple. Oh. I can move uh, staff recommendations for item um, 32.4 and 32.5. So they're sort of connected. I'll do it one at a time. Um, 32.4, I'll move the staff recommendations. Uh, we've tried a number of things to try and get this matter resolved. We'll continue to work on it, uh, but basically staff have been looking for some time for direction. Uh, so this is a directional report. Uh, this is uh, on a track for appeal. I hope we can solve it at the local level. There's very, very little more to do uh, to, to get this done. So um, I'll move the staff recommendations on that. Uh, all those, oh, any other speakers on the item? No, all those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. I'll also move 32.5. It's closely connected with the previous item. Once again, a directional report. Uh, we've worked hard to try and resolve some very small outstanding issues. Uh, so um, we've, been, we've been unable to do that. So they're looking for direction. Once again, this, this uh, authorizes staff to, um, to send legal representation on appeal. Uh, all, those, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Now I can release my fence exemption um, just see here. Now I wonder if she's willing to waive. No, I, I think I better uh, hold Mr. it down. Sure, I could release mine if there's no deputations. Sorry? Sorry, Councillor Robinson? She has speakers. Mine, if there's no deputation. Oh. Okay, so we'll, we'll hold. 20, the... 27 and 28. Okay, all right. So that's all we can release for now, I'm assuming. Yeah. The Yeah, there is a deputant on my uh, Joel Sawardski item, uh, but she's, she's coming back a little later. So I better hold that down because she wants to speak. Um, Bohan Lee, we're back on... 32-6-33-77 Bayview Avenue, which I'm sure we've heard enough of. Um, Bohan Lee. Ray, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Bohan, I'm an economist. My wife and I moved to Toronto just last year and we really love this city, right? And um, we wanna stay as long as we can. Uh, but you know, we're renters, uh, we're just starting our careers. And so the issue of housing affordability is a very important one for us. So the root cause of our housing affordability problem is that we simply don't have enough homes. Canada has the lowest housing per capita of the G7 countries, and we would need almost 2 million more homes to get to the average. The housing shortage in Ontario is especially bad. To get to the Canadian average, we're over 600,000 homes short. And this home shortage hurts our competitiveness, it hurts our working class, it hurts young people like me, and it hurts our minorities who are less likely to be homeowners. So the good news is economic studies of housing markets consistently find that building market rate homes reduces rents in the area, even for more affordable housing. And the reason is because when people move into these more expensive units, they leave behind cheaper units and make these units more competitive and less uh, and more affordable. So if we have a food shortage, we know we would be supporting the farmers, not attacking them for making a profit. And we should do the same for developers in our housing shortage. Now, I know there's various elements, you know, various concerns, and some of these can be very important concerns. And you know, the fact is that the neighborhoods would change when these developments are built. But the other fact is that there will always be excuses that we can find to stop development. You know, there will always be a view that's blocked. There will always be trees that have to be removed. There will always be additional traffic and those things. And every adjustment or obstacle that we put in these, the way makes housing more expensive and takes money away from our young and our poor. And oftentimes, like, you know, these concerns are too pessimistic. So I live on Bay and College. You know, it's very dense. And it's pretty sunny. It's a great place to live. There's a park just across the street. It gets sunlight. You know, I've looked at it just, just a minute ago. 
And, you know, these are not problems that are insurmountable. And I've also heard people calling out Shanghai. You know, I've been to Shanghai and it's a nice city. You know, I'd be very curious to hear why Councillor Mike Cole, uh, what problems that he has with the city and uh, why specifically this development will lead us to those problems. So I really ask that if you care about housing affordability, if you care about our young people, our economy, our values of inclusion and diversity, to please support this and other developments and to remove any obstacles that we can remove to get these houses built. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Any questions for the deputant? No, I don't see any. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mark Richardson of Housing Now TO. Nice to see you, Mark. You have five minutes. Okay. Uh, housing now to housing is a pro bono professional services collective uh, trying to improve affordable housing delivery in the city of Toronto. I want to assure Councillor Cole that we are not developer trolls. Next slide, please. Uh, we've worked with the Toronto Board of Trade on their housing for a generation of workers, their housing for essential workers. Next slide. Their housing for uh, essential workers, their priced out report. There's lots of reports that we've produced over the last few years that talk about the kind of people you want to have in the city and how we build the housing to get there. Next slide, please. Um, we've been tracking all of the Housing Now sites around the city. We've had 94,000 views of our public map. We're also tracking the open door sites, and obviously Tyndall Green is an open door site. Next slide. Toronto's population is expected to grow by 1.03 million between 2016 and 2041. This is your staff report. You need to find places for people to live. Next slide. This is your target that you all approved for the Housing TO 2030 targets for affordable housing. 40,000 new affordable rental units, 18,000 of them as supportive. Next slide, please. Three questions with affordable housing, because there are going to be no miracles in this city. Does it pencil? Does it make mathematical sense? Does it scale? Can we go faster and larger? And how do we speed up the delivery? Next slide, please. Tyndall Green is an open doors site. It's different from housing now. It's different from rapid and modular housing. It's different from inclusionary zoning. This is the program you have approved for privately owned lands. Up to 50% affordable housing is what you're asking for. Waiving taxes, fees, and the units is what you're asking for to create those affordable housing units. Next slide, please. So you're getting 750 permanent affordable rental housing units at the city's workforce housing rate in this proposal. That's bigger than most of your Housing Now sites. It's the biggest open door site that anybody has ever brought to the table for you. Next slide, please. This is the rental band that it will fall into for those affordable workforce housing units. Those are good rents. I know there's lots of concerns about the kinds of rents that will be charged. Those are good rents. If you want to make them cheaper, you can make this process go faster. You could give them more density. Next slide, please. Tyndall Green, what's the area like? Well, it's got a declining population. The darker the red gets, the, the more declining the population is. Next slide, please. Recurring local opposition. The folks here said they don't like this kind of affordable housing, but what's unusual is many of the same residents associations are also op opposing the modular housing site just a few blocks away, which is an even deeper level of affordability. Maybe they just don't agree with any affordable housing in that part of North York. Next slide, please. They've produced a really, really nice flyer. I mean, it's, it's tabloid size, it's heavy paper, you know, full color. This, this isn't cheap, and, and neither are Mr. Heise's services. Um, you know, we've got people with saying no to density signs on the lawn of their McMansion monster houses, 
with a three-car garage with a Range Rover parked out front. That three-car garage is bigger than any of the affordable housing units that they are protesting against. What are our priorities in this city? Next slide. Who is leading this opposition? Well, a lot of folks on Bowen Court. Bowen Court is all giant 4,000 square foot houses. There's a lot of backyard pools. Nobody protested in 1995 when they were building McMansions on Tyndall lands. But they're protesting now about affordable housing being built nearby. Next slide, please. So the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report came out this year. They uh, suggested that Ontario must build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years to address the supply shortage. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that every provincial political party has now signed on to that 1.5 million number in the current election. Next slide. Population density. There was some discussion about how dense parts of Toronto are. Uh, we're not as dense as Shanghai. We're not as dense as Tokyo. We're not even as dense as London or New York. We've got plenty of places to grow, and we just need to get off the pot and do it. Next slide, please. New housing is often the last priority. We'll talk about this hopefully during some questions, but uh, you have the slides. Next slide, please. This NIMBY versus YIMBY. NIMBYism, not in my backyard, is a large and constant obstacle to providing housing everywhere. Neighborhood pushback drags out the approval process, pushes up the cost, and discourages investment in housing. It keeps out new residents. While building housing is very costly, opposing housing costs almost nothing. An OLT appeal can cost you as little as $400 to tie up a project like this for two years. Next slide, please. Hi, Mr. Chair. Prohibiting reactive, uh, the problem with local opposition is that we, one of the recommendations in the Housing Task Force report was prohibiting re reactive heritage designations after the Planning Act application has been filed. Next slide. And also removing the ability to appeal developments where at least 30% of the housing is guaranteed for at least 40 years. Next slide. We endorse and encourage the letter that was sent to you from More Neighbors Toronto. We are really telling you on this program like this, it is do or do not, there is no try. 750, 750 permanent affordable rental housing, renting at the rates that you have set, the height, the density, the fast approvals make the affordable housing possible, and you're gonna to need to approve hundreds of projects like Tyndall Green by 2030 to meet your affordable housing targets. Thank you, uh, next slide. If you have any questions, you know how to reach us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for the deputant? Just a quick one. Yeah, Councillor Carroll. Just a quick one, uh, because uh, Mr. Richardson's presentations are getting so professional, they so, it, sometimes people think uh, you're a member of staff <laughs> making a presentation. No, I am, I am a small businessman. I am a volunteer. We started housing now three years ago because, frankly, your staff don't lay the numbers out clearly enough for people, and neighborhood groups use a lot of magical math. So um, in terms of, uh, you talk about this being the largest, uh, uh, um, yeah, I know you track all of them, and you talk about this being the largest application that allows us to, to create that middle income affordable housing at, at uh, up to 700 units, depending seven, on- seven, 750, in, 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 within the Open Doors program. Right, so right. Open Doors is privately owned land. Yeah, you They're can do more on your own land. Whatever number of units we end up at, 50% will be that. So that's why it's always worded up to. So my question is, is this, um, you, I think you were here earlier when uh, the marquee presentation was given. Their plan is to work out a pro forma where it's affordable in perpetuity. Yep. Are there any other applications offering that right now? Within the open door program? Yeah. In what's been approved? I do not believe so. Most of them have been 25 or 40 years. The yeah. only permanent ones have been your housing now sites, which are 99 years. Yes. And, on those, and on those housing now sites, you have to provide huge amounts of height and density and, and, and fee waivers to make the math work on your own land. Yeah, yeah, They're, those tend to be much more dense. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Thank no you. problem. 
Great. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Any other questions for the deputant? Councillor Cole? Yeah, no, thank you for the very good presentation. Uh, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, the Housing uh, Now Task Force never talked about the uh, speculation that occurs in housing where housing has become like a cryptocurrency for uh, investors and uh, numbered companies. Uh, what do you think about curbing the speculation uh, whereby people are flipping, buying uh, whole subdivisions, uh, whole uh, condo floors? Speculation in things like Beanie Babies or cryptocurrency only can happen where you are constraining the amount of product on the market and it does not meet anything close to the demand. So you don't have any problem with the speculation that goes on? Oh, I, I think speculation is a problem, but I think the way you solve speculation and hoarding of any kind is by flooding the market. Flooding the market. Yes. Talk about flooding the market. <laughs> Why is there so little attention given by your group and other groups about spreading the uh, housing around the province? Like the Minister of Housing lives in Brockville, beautiful place. Uh, there's only one building over four stories in Brockville. Why not incur, your group encourage some of the building to take place in Brockville? Because our name is Housing Now TO, not oh, okay. Housing Now Brockville. Okay, so just keep it all in Toronto. Thank you. I, well, I, your city's saying we've got a million more people coming by 2046. So are those numbers right or are they wrong? Yeah, so in other words, uh, you're just worried about Toronto. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the deputant? No? Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Gomes? No. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Nathan. Oh, okay, hi. Hi, Nathan. Hi, um, my, my name is Nathan Gomes. I'm the president of the Baby Carmer Neighborhood Association. Um, I understand you gave six minutes and 20 seconds to the Housing Now individual, so hopefully you'll give me some latitude as well. No, that was um, uh, an error in judgment. So let, just proceed with, okay. your, uh, okay. with your presentation. We'll see how it goes. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so I think, um, so we, my, my neighborhood association has represented our community for the last 44 years, uh, representing the area between Dumont, Steeles, uh, Finch and Bayview. Um, so on the, I guess at a looking more macro level, um, on the east side of our catch, on the west side of our catchment, we have, um, serious intensification coming with a young north planning study. Uh, we've been engaged uh, very much with our councillor uh, Fillion on that project, and uh, there's quite a lot of density happening. Um, there is a potential lane reduction on Young Street um, between um, uh, between Finch and Steeles. Um, there's also a scheduled lane reduction uh, for bicycle lanes on Willowdale Avenue. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're going to potentially see this massive intensification on our eastern boundary um which is you know out just outside of the ttc's uh i think it's like the eight i think earlier on it was 800 meters or something from the, the nearest station but um this area is definitely outside of that area um as the the city has has stated a numerous times um so I, I think the biggest issue uh that has come up in our area has been traffic uh, the massive uh, levels of intensification that we're going to see here. Um, the lane reductions on Young and Willowdale com compounded with this. Uh, potential a BRT on Steeles Avenue uh, with a potential lane reduction there. And a lot of our, like uh, my entire executive team, as well as, you know, many families in our neighborhood, we, you know, we we try to get around and, um, you know, it's it's becoming increasingly more challenging. A developer had said, Baby was a highway uh, in one of her her um, consultations, and you know that kind of struck a, it, it kind of angered the community a lot. Um, but you know we've been a very we've been very engaged on the working groups and all of those things. So like when you know they pulled out, uh, we were kind of decided to go into the Ontario Land Tribunal. We were kind of taken aback by that. Um, but at the same time, you know we have been quite engaged. Um, so things like um, 
you know, the building on the floodplain has been an issue. Um, we looked at the TRCA maps, um, and at least two buildings are being built on that. Um, we're seeing um, many of our deak like during the during the year, many of our kids attend Tyndale uh, for extracurriculars, and you know, in the summer there's summer camps. So many of those could disappear, and you know there's a lot of concern uh, with that. <clears throat> and I think um, you know the most like as someone who's grown up, I grew up, I, I was born and raised in Don Valley North, and I moved here to Don, you know, Willowdale to raise my family. And, um, you know, one of the things, like I went to school at Brave Off and, you know, I, I stood there as a young man, seeing the Pope land on the property. And, you know, this, this, we opened this session with a hundred year, hundred years of North York, commemorating a hundred years of North York and historical sites. And, you know, there are groups out there that like, you know, housing now that call, you know, our, our open, well, our parkland and our open spaces, lazy land, and they want to develop this land. But at the same time, planning has to be done properly. It can't be done ex in an expedient way. And we have to be, you know, think about the historical aspects. We have to be reasonable and think about all of these other things that are, you know, very important to our community and our cultural identity as, as North York, right? And, you know, we have to think about what we're going to keep, um, you know, bulldozing the school portion and saving the mother house, you know, the, the city is itself has said, you know, the school has historical properties to it. Right. So, you know, just all of the, the historical aspects of that is of concern. Also, you know, in terms of parking, there hasn't been in the consultation, in the, in the working group, we raised the, you know, many of our streets don't have parking on them and this site doesn't have adequate parking built into it for vehicles. So what's, going to happen because not everything is um, you can't necessarily bike to everything all your amenities so you know as families and people seek employment it's going to be you know they're they're going to want to own cars and they might park in our streets um, and we don't we don't even have sidewalks in many of them so you know a lot of that is uh, a lot of the concern so that's it's fine my five minutes are up you know I, I that that's what I'd just like to say just you know be reasonable there are a lot of people like housing now and, and groups like that, that are, you know, they see it as lazy land and they want to develop it, but we just have to be, have responsible development and that's what we're looking to see. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Nathan. Any questions for the deputant? No. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Um, now, Christina Chen, um, she was unavailable earlier. Is she on the line now? If not, I would call um, Paul Busca. Paul is not present. No? Okay. Um, Howard Price? Howard Price is not present. Okay. So, okay. So basically we've completed or called for all the deputants on this item. We'll consider deputations closed. Um, are there questions for staff? Councillor Carroll. Yeah, um, I'm gonna ask questions to staff. Um, having made notes uh, uh, throughout, I, I'm gonna ask some questions that I hope um, help community to understand what comes next, I'm, I'm predicting that we're gonna vote for the opposition of this. So, so uh, what remains is, is, is to leave an understanding of where we go from here. And uh, to that end, I wanted to ask uh, uh, staff to the table. Um, I understand we have legal and heritage staff and lastly, I'm gonna ask a question about what's in order of the clerk. Um, um, but uh, uh, first of all, to planning, because I would assume they're they're tuned in right off the bat. Uh, what what is before us today at Community Council is a request for city planning from city planning for direction. You're asking us to give you direction to the OLT, and you're asking us to give you the direction to go ahead and oppose this, but but also to continue uh, um, conversations with the developer. Am I right about that? Yes, that is, yes, Council, that is, that is correct. Um, 
the the request for direction report is simply to direct us to attend the Ontario uh, the Ontario Land Tribunal. And many of the issues that we've heard today from residents are identified in the request for direction report as issues that still are ongoing and still need to be resolved. So that right. is correct. There, there are issues for the community, but the, but many are also issues for 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 you for city planning. Correct issues right. issues about heritage issues about TRCA about traffic all those are still issues that remain on the table. Okay, and uh, now the the residents, many of whom we've spoken today, have made their own application for for this to be considered a heritage site, including the landscape, and uh, uh, but there's. The, the, the report speaks, and you've, you've spoken in working group before, of, of reviewing the heritage. There is a heritage review ongoing, uh, but there now is also an application. Does that halt the OLT appeal process in any way? I can take this one. Um, I'm sure it's Jessica Braun from Legal. Um, I I can say that it does not halt the OLT process. The hope is that whatever goes forward on this site, there will be agreement as with respect to the heritage value. If there is no agreement between the city and the applicant, if there is a dispute, that part of the process can also be dealt with uh, at the OLT. Right. Under, under Bill process. 108, in fact, it has to be dealt with there, does it not? My That's read correct. of it is as if, if the application came in after July 1st, 2021, ultimately it, 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 it has to be determined there because the, the, the uh, appellant can require it to be dealt with there. Am I right about that? That's right. Unless there's agreement with the appellant, which we're still working towards, I understand. Right, right. Okay. Now, and, and I'm wondering, since an, an application, a heritage application has been filed, which means that, that staff does have to, uh, to add that to their study and report on it. Um, so the question is, uh, how do you go about that? And, and how can the community continue to be involved in that? Do they, do they get a chance to speak to that over and above today? I'm going to let Heritage staff handle that one. I apologize. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, it's Tamara at St. Cartwright. Well, oh, hi, Tamara. Yes, it's about the it's about the 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 application. You've been studying it and and working with the the applicant already because they they've noted the heritage concerns, but you now have the application from the community as well which means you, I believe that means you have to report on it. Where does that report go? And, and how can the community continue to, to uh, be involved in that, to speak to that, to the, to the heritage application that they've filed? Right, through the chair, Councillor. Um, the nomination is a, is a uh, process that, or a form that comes into us. We like to update and repeat, uh, go back to the community when it's uh, possible. In this case, it was uh, um, in alignment with the work that we're already doing for uh, the planning application. Sometimes we get nominations that are not related to planning. But in this case, of course, we've been, we've been working actively. We will bring forward a staff report to the Toronto Preservation Board, and that will be the opportunity to which uh, the community and any anyone can uh, comment, uh, the preservation panel, et cetera, uh, to the, the Preservation Board on the substance of it, uh, the, the research that we've done, and also to share their perspective uh, on, on the report. And we anticipate that this, this report on a, a notice of intention to designate, we're working towards that uh, to be done um, in the coming months. Uh, uh, we have an opportunity to do, uh, certainly do it before the end of the year. Thank you. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, and then lastly, I want to ask some questions about um, the, the, the attorney for the community um, has, uh, has opened a, a, a legal possibility. He, he writes um, that we have the right to do an interim control bylaw. And so what I want to ask legal, and then I'll ask the clerks a similar question, would an interim control bylaw actually stop the current OLT proceeding that we're giving direction for today? Um, no, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the interim control bylaw controls the ability of the city uh, buildings department to issue 
a building permit. It has no impact. Uh, it would not stop the OLT proceeding from going ahead. Oh, okay. And the building permit process, even if this did go ahead, if they, if they were successful in the hearing and everything, that's a long way off. Yeah. It's a very long way off. And the yeah. control bylaw only lasts a year okay. and requires, yeah, has other criteria. So the answer is no. It would not stop the OLT I process. Six and okay. a half minutes. And, and, oh, sorry. I just had one other question of the clerk. Okay. Okay, um, just to the clerk, would it be in order, we're in North York Community Council, not council, would it be in order to move anything related to the heritage that we've just heard is going to another committee, um, uh, be it to support the designation or to move an interim control bylaw to, to support the heritage study, would that be in order here in North York Community Council? Through the chair, my advice is that it would not be in, in order. Um, the heritage designation is not before the community council today. This is a request for directions report and heritage designations are in the jurisdiction of the Toronto Preservation Board and also pl the Planning and Housing Committee. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that clarifies it and I hope people are still listening. Okay. Um, I just want to speak. Okay, we're not there yet. Okay, any other questions for staff? Uh, Councillor Cole. Yeah, I just want something clarified. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, that it's $400 to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal. My understanding that is not the case, that it's $1,100 now. Do we have a, a dollar figure on that? The mysterious Land Tribunal. The, the mysterious members. How much? Anybody from planning know? What's the yeah, cost? That is correct. It's, it's, it's eleven hundred dollars on the appeal. Okay, so it's not four hundred. Inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's eleven hundred dollars, right? Okay. And um, another question I had is, in Bill One Hundred Eight, there was one of the changes to Bill One Hundred Eight. Uh, basically, dealt with. Uh, the ability to override a heritage designation. Can I have a clarification on that, uh, what Bill 108 did in terms of uh, heritage designation? Uh, good, good afternoon again. It's Tamara Anson Cartwright, Program Manager in Heritage uh, through the chair. Bill 108 uh, allowed for or has now required municipality to uh, issue a notice of intention to designate 90 days after a planning application is deemed or the notice is of completion for a planning ap application. In this case, the proponent or the applicant uh, marquee has waived that timeline um, and has an open uh, extension until we're able to do the designation. Thank you. Okay, so in uh, sort of Canadian Tire English, uh, what change does that mean to uh, members of the community seeking heritage designation? Uh, the, the only change is if the timeline is, is uh, adhered to and there is no waiver, uh, city council has to make a decision within 90 days and has no other future opportunity. That doesn't exist in this case. We have open dialogue and we have uh, an extended timeline. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for staff? No, I don't see anything from our remote participants. Okay, speakers. Uh, Councillor Carroll. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, I'm going to move the, the, the staff recommendation that, that we give them direction to oppose today. Um, but I do want to speak to it uh, uh, briefly, and I, I really want to thank uh, my colleagues for, for listening to the community today, because they, they have a great many concerns. And, and uh, um, despite the fact that we're opposing, as you know, uh, we oppose, but we go on discussing. Um, it, despite all efforts to, to make people understand, we really have to account for the fact that the OLT is making a slow move back to something resembling the de novo hearing we thought we'd seen the last of. And so um, despite their asking that we, that we leave it at that, oppose and have no further discussion with the applicant, 
uh, that I, I could not in good conscience leave the community that vulnerable. That, that would be leaving this community quite vulnerable because the, the reality is the, uh, um, you know, if we, if we did not speak and, and hearing dates came and went, uh, we could be in a situation, the OL team does now have the ability to not necessarily drive it back to the city for settlement. They can say, okay, you're, you don't seem to be getting cooperation and they could adopt whatever they want to adopt. And there are too many things still outstanding. Most of the density concerns that you heard about are really contained in phase three of this development, the more dense area to the north end of the section. And we haven't even begun to discuss that. It was very hard to get, there are so many concerns that it was hard to get the working group to focus in and, and deal with the topic at hand. And in fact, by the time the application came in, we didn't even get to talking about height and massing. Um, anywhere, let alone in phase three, where we, we have a big conversation to have on the subject of massing. We, you, you'll notice in the drawings that we're really just looking at something resembling a, a development notice on the street with the orange blocks. We haven't really discussed step backs, street wall guidelines. Uh, uh, are you keeping within the three or four stories or not? We haven't discussed any of that yet in detail and certainly not with the community. We didn't get there yet and that needs to be discussed. The unit mix, as you heard from the community, it's not 100% there yet and it's not, it's not there in, in my view either because where we, we talk about uh, uh, middle income affordable housing, which would be half of the units here, um, the focus is very often families. There, there. You could be a hardworking uh, uh, single mom earning seventy grand a year. This, this, these are your only housing options with kids, and so um, that conversation has to happen. And lastly, but as you heard, almost most importantly, uh, you you heard from uh, you know alumni from the schools, um, and uh, and people who for whom the the, the church has held very deal deer and all the landscape around it. Staff do have concerns about heritage. It is in the report that they are continuing to work on that um, with heritage staff, with the applicant, and those are not nailed down or resolved yet. Um, and, uh, and, and all those have to be designed. So while it is opposed, we do want to continue to discuss because waiting in the wings is a conditional approval. Hard cash has not been allowed. Uh, we heard a deputant talking about there's 56 million floating around here. There's a placeholder that out of those funds that we use for affordable housing from the open door program, that if this goes ahead, they would be eligible for up to 750 units worth under the open door program. But the, the cash is not sitting in a bank uh, held by the applicant at this point. We've got to figure that out as a result of this. Um, and lastly, I want to be clear uh, with folks because um, the, uh, the, the traffic comes up again and again, um, not necessarily with the deputants that have been here, but really everyone in the community is concerned about this. So when I go about the community, I did a tour of storm damage this weekend and often ended up talking about this. The traffic that people are most concerned about, as you heard me admonishing a deputy this morning almost, there is great misunderstanding. Because we're so early in the process, the ultimate finished traffic plan isn't even done yet. And, and while that has to be worked out, what it does not include, and I can't stress this emphatically enough, there is no plan to reduce the width of Bayview by one lane. I, I suspect if, we were, if that plan existed, Councillor Fillion would have something to say about it because he's, he's uh, 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 my, uh, my boundary partner on that avenue. And we simply had a theoretical consultation and people have decided that's a finished proposal with a, with a, a deadline and that's going to happen. And it most certainly is not. The traffic plan, if this thing goes ahead, is something that will, of course, come back and be shared with the community. But in the meantime, um, we are, we are uh, leaving staff with the ability to go to the OLT, OLT and say, we, we must oppose this because there are so many outstanding concerns. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your, your patience today. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Is there anyone who wants to speak? Anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Uh, Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, this is a uh, fascinating uh, item, you might say. Uh, but it's a very beautiful area, too. Uh, very familiar with it uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, I just want to say that uh, it sort of highlights the uh, dilemma we face in the city of Toronto. Uh, you know, there's obviously uh, there's a belief that everybody should be coming to Toronto and living in Toronto, yet there are the same pressures for intensification are never to be seen in Brockville and these other places. And, you know, especially now with the um, ability to work remotely, you know, you would think that uh, one of the initiatives would be to encourage people to live in some of our beautiful communities outside of the GTA, outside of Toronto, but obviously that's not uh, in the, uh, on the agenda. And so subsequently, we are faced with, in Toronto, of uh, dealing with a lot of these applications uh, and are very, very contentious, uh, and this is obviously one. And it's hard to get people to understand the reality of what's happening, because uh, I know that uh, I had a, a, a development that we approved at this uh, committee for a four-story townhouse on Marley Avenue. Well, a couple of the local residents who oppose everything, they oppose the... Uh, uh, the uh, four-story townhouse and uh, basically w went to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And uh, so the uh, development, the developer said, okay, I'm withdrawing my application. I'm coming back with 14 stories. And even if you try and tell the residents that, you know, this is what you're going to get, you're lucky uh, four stories uh, is reasonable. No, 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 we don't want, we want single-family homes on a major street like Marley. So now they have to deal with an application that's coming in 14 stories. Uh, so it's really hard to explain this to people because this new regime of the Ontario Land Tribunal, the I think we've had unprecedented changes in planning never seen before in Toronto in the last uh, four years. And it's hard for, never mind our planning staff to keep up, but certainly our residents to keep up with all the complexities of uh, the new planning regimes that take place. Um, and, you know, the, everybody's degree of tolerance varies. Uh, like, I have an application now just south of Councillor Pasternak's ward there where they have a development for 19 30-story towers in one block. Yeah, 19. That doesn't include the other 30-story uh, towers across the street that have been approved, they're under construction at the old, uh, your favorite spot, the old Holiday Inn there. But so, you know, so you can imagine if you're going to get 40 and there's no park, there's no affordable components, there's nothing but towers. Well, there's one of the towers is a hotel. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the development blocks in my ward. I've got a total of uh, 72 uh, developments, uh, ranging from uh, eight stories to uh, 70 stories. And that doesn't include the development in Councillor Robinson across the street that she's got wall-to-wall uh, -wall high rises. Doesn't include uh, Councillor Matlow's wall-to-wall -wall high rises. Doesn't include Eglinton Square, or uh, the um, Canada Square with uh, seven 70 story buildings across the street from my ward. So you can imagine why people are getting very uh, antsy about what's happening. They don't understand why it's all happening now and how are they going to handle everything. Uh, how, you know, traffic always comes up. Uh, and I try to tell them, you know, the Ontario Land Tribunal isn't going to even think twice about traffic impacts. So, you know, you can talk about that day and night, but they're not even going to consider that. And then, you know, the thing that doesn't come up is the community infrastructure. No libraries, no parks, no schools. So you can build these great uh, new centers, but there is no comparable investment in community infrastructure. You know, so these people that are going to be living in these boxes in the sky, where are they going to go to sit and enjoy a bit of grass or a bit of fresh air or a bit of sunlight. 
that is the challenge we face, we're faced with as counselors, trying to ensure that there are some community needs that are met that are essential for good health and good living. Uh, so that is uh, what's come out in this uh, uh, debate here today and uh, discussion and uh, that uh, deserves further consideration as uh, Councillor Carroll is uh, alluding to. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Uh, I'm looking to our uh, remote councillors. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item? No. Okay. Uh, Councillor Carroll, you are moving staff recommendations? Okay, staff recommendations on the floor. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. We'll now move on to item 32.7, uh, timed item for uh, 9.45 uh, this morning. Um, 307 Shepherd Avenue West. Um, Councillor Fillion, is, this is your item? Yes, I've I'll move staff recommendations staff. if there's no speakers. Yeah, so I'll just confirm with the clerk. We have no speakers listed on this item. Uh, Councillor Fillion has moved staff recommendations. Uh, any other speakers on the item? Any other speakers on the item? No? Okay, staff recommendations. I just want to say a thanks to uh, staff for the quick turnaround on this one. One of the few times we've uh, got the refusal in before the appeal. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Next item is traffic calming on uh, Lillian Street. Also, uh, Councillor Fillion. I, th um, I think this was held because there was a deputant. No? Oh, it's Nathan Gomes again. Yes, uh, Mr. Gomes, are you are you still available? I'm still I'm still here, Councillor Pasternak. How are okay, you doing? Uh, thank you for uh, staying with us. Uh, you have five minutes. Um, <clears throat> so, as you know, I'm the president of the Baby Cumber Neighborhood Association. Uh, Lillian Street uh, is a um, I guess it's formally designated as a local road. Uh, but it functions as a collector road, um, as all the, I guess, the inner streets connect to it to get to Steeles Avenue. Um, I guess, you know, similar to the concerns uh, raised by Councillor Menden Wong earlier, um, this particular street, um, you know, has been subject to traffic calming over the, I would say, the last decade. Um, its speed limit was reduced to 30 kilometers an hour. Um, it's, it was, it had, um, I guess, is it photo radar or yeah it had the the traffic um the speeding cams there um and you know the the staff report shows that um it has a thousand sixteen or thousand nineteen uh cars vehicles per day which just barely puts it into um the the criteria as a local road um and it's far below the 25,000 required for, uh, sorry, not 25, uh, 2,500 required for a collector road. Um, so we were wondering if it would be possible before we spend, you know, $32,000 $32, on a street uh, that, you know, it has, it residents in the area are already finding it um, challenging, you know, traveling at 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and it is, it is very, you know, not, there isn't heavy speeding in the particular area. I mean, the tra the uh, the automatic enforcement uh, camera was already moved from the area and it has never been put back. It was like the first location. Um, you know, my question is: is this is this thirty two thousand uh, dollars money well spent? Um, my neighbors and and along Lillian Street, like Lillian Park, is in my backyard, and Lillian Street is like right there. And you know, speaking with all the residents um, in the particular area along Center and you know, many of the streets in the area, you know, this is not something that, you know, they're in favor of. Um, so, you know, while this is going to poll, um, you know, I, I would appreciate it if you could also let us know uh, when you are polling uh, the residents so that we can make sure that there's a sizable uh, uh, number because you I think you only have, require 25 percent 
Um, so I just want to make sure that when the poll goes out, um, that the staff, you know, remember to, to notify us so that we can make sure that, you know, all the residents along the area are notified that are impacted. So we, you know, we're happy to partner with the city and, and get that poll out and make sure there's a proper, uh, proper number of people uh, responding to it. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that. Any questions for the deputant? Reminder, we're on item 18, Lillian Street, traffic calming. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you um, for your deputation, Nathan. And uh, I don't have any other deputants on this item. I will go to questions for staff. I do not see any questions for staff. I'll go to speakers. Uh, Councillor Fillion. Uh, yes, I'll move the staff recommendations. And the, my office has heard from um, a lot of people who are very concerned about uh, the speed of cars and the safety on Lilliet Avenue, a uh, very large number. And uh, so we'll see what the results of the poll are. And uh, no, we are not going to contaminate the poll by uh, encouraging somebody to lobby on one side of it or another. It is uh, a neutral poll, and we'll see what the results are. I'll okay. move the staff recommendations. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Philly. And staff recommendations are being moved. Are there any other speakers on the item? No? Okay. Uh, staff recommendations moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Uh, we're now going to um, item number 23, offense exemption, and Keeley Fisher uh, is the deputy listed. And Ms. Fisher, I appreciate, I appreciate your patience. It's been a long day. Uh, thank you very much for waiting. Uh, you have five minutes. Is the mic on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Do you all have access to see the staff report? Okay. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name's Keely Fisher. I'm a public elementary school teacher and I live with my husband Randy, who's a dentist in the community and our two sons who are 14 and 12. During the pandemic, their camps were closed for two summers. So we decided to build a pool for them. We hired a recommended contractor. However, we needed to terminate him in the end as he took on too many jobs and did not show up to work. The pool was very delayed and we weren't able to open it last year due to the construction being so delayed. Our contractor commit, uh, submitted a drawing to the city which was approved for a pool enclosure. Um, can I show it? Oh, you have it already? Okay, can you see that very well? Okay, so our contractor submitted a drawing to the city, which was approved. This is the drawing that was approved. He made a small error on the drawing and depicted a landing at the top of our steps, leading from our sliding doors down to our patio. There is no such landing. We just have four steps that go directly down from our patio door to, to the, um, to, sorry, from our sliding door to the patio. There's no landing at the top. Upon realizing that we could not build it exactly as drawn, I requested that a bylaw officer visit the site to consult on how to proceed. Alessandro visited and advised me verbally that we had already received approval and that as long as the glass gate was self-closing, locking, and completely blocking the sliding doors, it would be fine. I called the city once more and requested another visit before ordering the fence at the side of our house that blocks our entrance. We wanted to make sure that we built it in compliance with the bylaw since we no longer had our contractor working for us. Another officer, Mary Jane, made two visits and did not ever mention a problem with the enclosure around the sliding doors. She had taken pictures and um, did a complete inspection of all three of the um, gates that we had put up fences. It wasn't until she shared pictures of it with her supervisor, which was a year later, uh, that we were notified that what we built is deemed a gate and not an enclosure, and it wasn't exactly as in the approved drawing. 
we were given two options, either build it according to the approved drawing or apply for a fence exemption. Well, we could not build it according to the drawing because we don't have, the existing landscape is not what we have. We don't have a landing at the top of the steps, so we couldn't enclose a landing. We consulted a reputable pool enclosure company and we're, we were advised that what we built was the only option to block access, access to our home. An enclosure around the steps would be within 1.2 meters of the edge of the pool and that is not permitted. Given our wide but not very deep lot and existing patio steps, there wasn't enough room to build out an enclosure as pictured in the approved drawing. The gate had to be closely against the house to meet the other bylaw requirements. What we built is a high, non-climbable, self-closing and locking gate that completely blocks our sliding doors and when I stand behind it, it comes up to my shoulder. We are very concerned about safety and have consulted with city officers every step of the way for guidance and followed their advice. We were totally shocked when we were told that a year later our gate would not be allowed because it wasn't exactly as pictured. This small error on the part of our contractor is now what is preventing us from opening our pool. Since there is no other option for building another type of pool enclosure, we are appealing to you to please grant us permission to open our pool. The city has given you an option to allow it. In no way are we seeking a true exemption to the rules, just a minor variance allowance. We have done everything we can to ensure complete safety. There is no way that a child could gain access to our pool from our sliding doors. We have the support of all of our neighbors who have seen the gate and been informed of this hearing. Our neighbor with whom we share our largest fence has written a letter of support as well. Please vote in favor of this minor fence variation and allow us to open our pool. The alternative is never being able to open it and all the money, time, construction and disturbance to neighbors will have been for nothing. We have built the only structure we could to meet the bylaw as closely as possible. Thank you for your consideration. I can show, uh, project a picture of what we have as well, another one. Oh, there we go. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. It's very thorough. Uh, are there questions for the deputant? Do you have questions? No, um, I, I would simply say that uh, I, I guess you were in regular contact uh, with the city. Yes, I to, was. To, to make sure uh, that you had everything right. I called them out at my request multiple times and we had uh, two different officers visit and speak with me directly and look at everything. Those two officers said that it was fine, uh, told me it would be completely fine what we built, and then um, it was only when the last officer sent pictures to her supervisor that she said that it wouldn't be allowed. Right. It's because it's not deemed an enclosure. It's deemed a gate the way that it was. So, so what you're saying is you, you've taken no shortcuts here. You've, com you've pretty well complied and, and made a, a, a constructed a, a, a safe enclosure. Area. I think the intention of the bylaw is to ensure that a child cannot gain access to the pool from the house, and there's no way that a child can gain access to the pool from our house. For either of the three entrances, we, we have two others. We have another sliding door, which has been completely blocked by glass panels that was approved. Um, the side fence gate has also been erected with a self-closing lock and has also been approved. Um, this was the one where there was that minor um, variance in the drawing where it wasn't a three-dimensional enclosure around a landing at the top of our steps. It was just completely blocking the gate. But once again, a bylaw officer came out, saw it, and said that that would be completely allowed so long as it blocked off access from our home to the pool. Right, and if I'm looking at your uh, package correctly, it's attachment G where you have a photograph showing that there is no landing. Uh, yeah, there's no landing. There's four steps down. There never was a landing. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Any other questions for the deputant? No? Okay, great. Thank you very much okay. for your deputation. Thank you so much for waiting. Thank you. Um, questions for staff? Speakers, and I will speak, and then anyone else can join in. Um, I'm going to be um, moving number two. I'm granting the request for the property owners at uh, 48 Joel Sawartsky Boulevard for the exemption. Um, I have spoken with the, uh, with the owner of the property. Um, 
about this matter. I have uh, listened carefully to the deputation. I've gone through the paperwork here. Uh, there was a, what seems to be a slight error in the original plan of a contractor who, um, who made an error in the drawing. Unfortunately, uh, the property owner um, had their pool delayed uh, up to a year, uh, the opening of their pool delayed. I, I believe that what we have here is someone who's not skirting any of the rules, who's extremely diligent. If you look at uh, attachment B, she called the city numerous times to make sure uh, that she was following all the rules and made the pool safe and conforming to our bylaws. So I, I believe we have an extremely safe um, pool enclosure. I believe that this homeowner has followed all the rules and is not looking for any shortcuts. And I believe we should, uh, I, I'm going to grant the request for the exemption. Thank you. I also have the support of all of my neighbors and a letter that you can refer okay. to as well. Okay. Them. Well, we're at, okay. we're in, we're in commit, back in committee. So thank you very much. And uh, if there's any other speakers on the item, I'd be prepared to recognize them. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, number two is on the floor, the granting the request for the property owners for the exemption. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, the exemption has been granted. Thank you. No, you're very Thank welcome. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Take care. Next item. Um, 3224, um, a request for a fence exemption, 232 Old Forest Hill Road. And we have two uh, deputants. Uh, I believe an Esther K is here in the, in the council chamber. Is that, a, is that a flashlight you've got there? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I didn't think it was that dark in here. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for your patience. And uh, you have five minutes. Is the mic on? It is on. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the committee council for allowing me to address my concerns with the existing fence at 232 Old Forest Hill Road that is in violation of the open fence requirement and the exemption requested. My name is Esther Kay, and I have lived at 228 Old Forest Hill Road since 1974. My concern with the fence is an issue of safety. My safety and the safety of pedestrians and motorists on Old Forest Hill. With all the subway and LRT construction on Eglinton, Old Forest Hill has become a major throughway for motorists looking to avoid the Bathurst and Eglinton intersection on their way to the Allen Expressway. Um, there has also been a lot of foot traffic. We have a beautiful neighborhood where people love to walk with their families, with their dogs, and with their children in strollers. We are also very lucky to live in a safe neighborhood where kids roam with their friends at all times of the day. This is what makes our neighborhood special. But the fence on 232 Old Forest Hill is creating an unnecessarily dangerous environment for all those traveling on Old Forest Hill. This fence runs along the western side of my driveway. <clears throat> because the fence is not open construction, when I exit my driveway, I cannot see either motorists or pedestrians coming eastbound on the street. As is shown on, on the photograph at page eight, uh, there are three full panels of the fence which should be open construction to comply with the Toronto Municipal Code. In addition to the fence, there is a hedge that runs along the north side of the property that in the spring and summer is more than three feet and in full bloom, such that I cannot see through the hedge either. 
The picture on page nine is an excellent representation of the obstructions on the west side of my driveway. As I back out of my driveway, the rear of my car must pass through the entirety of the sidewalk and the rear of my car is actually on the road before the front window of the car clears the fence and the hedge. And I can see whether there are pedestrians walking eastbound in front of my house. Uh, my car is on the road before I can identify whether uh, there is any traffic coming. The fence in conjunction with the head creates a treacherous environment on a busy street which enforcement of the code was meant to avoid. As you can see from the picture on page seven of the out of complete fear, I have started to back into my driveway when possible just to increase my opportunity to see beyond the fence and the hedge as I exit my driveway. But this is not always possible due to the heavy traffic on the street. Um, having looked at the photographs provided by the property owner, I do not agree that any of them are precedents for the issue being considered by the community council. Firstly, the addresses of the homes are not apparent, so it is impossible to determine whether these examples are on streets with the significant traffic of Old Forest Hill, two blocks from the Allen. We don't know whether the neighbor of those homes consented to the exemption because they felt that their line of sight was satisfactory. Also of the six pictures, only two driveways have sidewalks running through them. I cannot tell you whether exemptions were required in those other pictures or why they were given. All I can tell you about is my property, my driveway, and a fence that contravenes the TMC. Um, I can tell you is my fear each and every time I pull out of my driveway that I am either going to hit a stroller, a child, or a dog. Allowing that fence to remain in its current form is simply dangerous. It is a ticking time bomb for a jogger running at a quick pace who will get hit by my car even as I take every precaution to pull out of my driveway safely. I can appreciate that the configuration of the lot at 232 means that this fence is a rear fence and that the um, owner would like privacy in their backyard. But this fence runs along my driveway and in conjunction with the You'll hedge, have to, uh, you're well over five minutes if you could wrap up. Yes. Thank um, you. Near the end, sorry. Uh, it obstructs my view until I am already through the uh, silent road. Safety of the community has to be the priority in all decisions made by this community council. And if, it, if this is the case, the exemption cannot be considered. Thank you. All right, thank you for your deputation. Any questions for the deputant? Uh, I, I just have a couple. Um, so you're, <laughs> I don't know something. Are, you're the next door neighbor. Yes. Is that, is that right? Yes. So when you're pulling out of your driveway, uh, the, the fence itself blocks your sight line. So you can't see pedestrians or other people using the sidewalk. And does it block um, also the, the sight lines for seeing vehicles? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Pearson. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Mr. Pearson. Yeah. Could, yep. Would I be able to um, share my screen, please? Uh, yes. This is the host of Jeremy Pearson. You've been provided with the sharing rights. So at the bottom of your yeah, we do panel, have you um, be able to hit the share button. We do have a full package here. You uh, have the full package. Okay. Well, um, so I'd I'd like to 
first um, acknowledge that I've spoken to officers from uh, municipal licensing and from transportation services um, several times trying to um, figure out where the problem was because when the contractor originally built this fence, it was thought to comply. And I think, you know, we have this figured out. But before, before that, I'd like you to look, please, at um, page six uh, at the photograph. And um, so you can see through the little corner, our backyard, and uh, we built the fence. It's not just a matter of privacy. We actually had Muskoka chairs. People, like some people jumped over that little wrought iron fence and stole Muskoka chairs out of our backyard. We've got kids, we've got dogs. Every person that comes by go, walks up into Esther's driveway with their dog to, you know, to look at our dogs, to, to you know, Esther herself stands in the driveway on a regular basis. Um, you know, basically right at our backyard. So yes, it, it's privacy, but it's also security. Um, you know, if you look down a couple of pages to uh, the traffic uh, picture on page nine, that's a pretty regular thing where cars are driving up onto the sidewalk right there. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't wait for this picture. I was I was filling out the application form and then, uh, you know, I just went outside to take a picture and that's what would happen to be there. It's fairly common. Um, so, you know, our entire backyard and back door of our house is exposed without the fence. Um, so that's why we built it, but I want to address the sight line issue. So if we go back up to page six to the photograph, uh, you'll see that there's a big hundred year old tree there with a, a three plus foot wide trunk and bushes that have been there for over 20 years that have been obstructing the view that um, that uh, Esther has been talking about for for years and years and years. The addition of that fence does not obstruct any more of the view than what was already obstructed. Additionally, um, the front part of the fence is with the the under the purview of the transportation services because it's technically on city property. And if you take that little corner where the driveway meets the sidewalk on the bottom right corner, they for for line of sight what their requirement is um three meters up the driveway and three meters along the sidewalk and like a triangle if that makes sense um so that when someone's coming out of the driveway you can you have three meters from the sidewalk and you look through and you're able to see the traffic now i'll acknowledge that the the bushes are in that little triangle they kind of obscure the view um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but the fence itself, you know, the contractor measured, it's not ex quite three, three meters. It's a little bit less. It, it's a, it's a few inches past where it should be technically, but, uh, you know, when we built it, he measured three meters, he built the fence, right? So now why is it a problem? If we go down because of go down to page seven, you'll see in the picture in page seven, it shows that the property line is actually, you know, way up the driveway, like halfway up the driveway. So the part of the fence that doesn't comply is that part circled in red, which is not, you know, even the end of the fence. So, so the part to the left of the, of the lot line is the part that doesn't comply, those three little parts. And the part on the right of the, you know, that's closer to the street actually does comply because it falls under a different bylaw. So, you know, if we were, if, if we were to, um, if you were to make me take it down or uh, the part that we're talking about here, it would just be those three panels circled in red and the other panel is actually allowed to stay according to what the enforcement officers have told me. Um, now I understand um, Esther's, um, you know, it's a hot, it, there's a lot of traffic there. It's hard to get in and out. Um, what I've been talking about with the uh, with the transportation services enforcement officer is to make that little triangle to lower down that those hedges, and um, I'm 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 going to apply for an exemption for those few inches of the fence that actually are are past where they're supposed to be, but it's literally a few inches from that from that sidewalk. It's supposed to be three meters, and it's it's a little bit less. It's uh, eight feet or something. Um, so my intention is to clear the bushes a little bit in that corner where that electrical box is to give her a little bit more view 
And that would actually um, give her a better line of sight than what she originally had before the fence was even there and a better line of sight than what she's had for the last 20 years of those bushes being there. Um, okay, so, so that's it. I I'd, think, like to, I'd like yeah. to just say, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so, no, thank you very much. Um, I've got you to about five minutes now. So are there any wasn't running, sorry. Are there any questions for the deputant? So I, I have a couple. So you're you're saying that the, the fence itself is not the problem, it's the hedges? Is that what Well no. What I'm saying is the part of the fence in question here is the second panel back. Not the first panel. The first panel on city property apparently complies with the line of sight. Uh, the, uh, um, it's the second panel back. And if you make me remove that, it, I mean, it just gives her a view of my backyard. It doesn't give her a view of the street. There's a big tree there and bushes that have been there for 20 years. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll ask questions with staff. Okay. Any other questions for the deputant? No? And 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 by the way, it is a, people who have jumped to that little fence, that little wrought iron fence, which is all there used to be there, into my backyard. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for your deputation. Uh, we're going to bring it thank into you. committee now. Um, committee members, are there questions for staff? Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, just staff. Uh, in terms of uh, this uh, fence, uh, when was it? Do we have an idea when it was erected? Built? Uh, through the chair, um, through the chair, this is Simi speaking with MLS. Um, that we are not sure. That would be the property owners um, would be better to answer that question. Did they get a permit? Was there a permit issued for the building of this fence? Uh, there is no permit required to build a fence on private property. Okay, so therefore, this is on private property, no permit required. Yet it violates the city bylaw, right? Uh, that is correct. Um, so the second panel and the half of the third panel um, need to be open fence construction. Uh, the height and all that is uh, in compliance. However, the fact that you can't see through it is the issue. Yeah, so therefore, uh, normally a builder of, of the fence would uh, know these uh, city requirements, would they not? Uh, it is the property owner's responsibility to ensure that they read the bylaw and comply with the provisions set out, uh, contractors as well. So what if they lowered the, uh, what's the two and a half panels, right, that are not in compliance? Yes, uh, the one and a half. One and a half panels. So what if they lowered the one and a half panels to the same level as a wrought iron fence? Would that be in compliance? Uh, technically, it would not be, as uh, the fence does require to be open fence construction within 2.4 meters of a driveway. So even if they lowered it uh, to the wrought iron, it still would not be in compliance. Uh, so uh, in terms of... Uh, What's the rationale for doing this, uh, for having this requirement that they beat uh, uh, transparent or, or see-through fences? Why do we have that uh, uh, code or bylaw in place? So the reason is for um, sightline obstructions. Uh, so when a driver is either um, going in and out of a driveway or a pedestrian is walking um, it, so that it doesn't obstruct the, the boulevard. Right. So therefore, uh, the uh, driver, like in this case, the Honda I see parked there, uh, they should be able to uh, see an oncoming car coming uh, to the left of that car, right? That's why. This, that is. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for staff? Okay, uh, we're on to speakers. Um, Councillor Cole? Yeah, no, this is, uh, again, it's uh, complicated, it's confusing, and, but on the other hand, uh, 
you know, it is a safety concern that uh, the neighbor has raised, and uh, it is uh, not in compliance with uh, our uh, code, our municipal code, uh, and um, it can uh, be seen as a danger uh, to uh, the, uh, the driver, the owner of that property driving out, not being able to see uh, when they're leaving their driveway. So it's pretty difficult to uh, be comfortable in allowing this when the safety concern has been raised uh, on a very busy street, that's for sure. Uh, so I'm going to have to um, uh, move uh, acceptance of uh, number one, the refuse to grant uh, the property owner the exemption for this fence. Okay, uh, Councillor uh, Cole has moved uh, staff, uh, sorry, option option number two is granting. Nope. No, no. Number one. Oh, you're moving refusal? Yeah. Please, I'm sorry, I yes. So, okay, so Councillor Cole is moving refusal. Uh, any other speakers on the item? Okay, uh, refusal is, uh, is on the floor. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Um, I believe that carries. Yeah, yeah, could we, could we have? Can we have all councillors uh, vote on this? It's not a recorded vote, but we, 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 should, we should make sure we've got it right. Councillor Cole has moved number one, refusal. Um, all those in favor? There you go. There, okay. Okay. Opposed? That carries. Next item. Uh, item number 25. Um, application for fence exemption 188 York Mills Road. Uh, we have a deputant here. We have Sami Rafia, uh, um, My Oasis Construction, Inc. Uh, is Sami on the line? Good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I am Sami Rafi, the applicant and the builder of the uh, project on 188 York Mills Road. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee for giving us the time and the opportunity today to present our case. Uh, we have applied for a fence exemption uh, for this project uh, as we feel like we are packed into a corner uh, and are unable to complete the pool enclosure spe uh, specifically uh, to limit the access from inside the house to the pool area. Um, does everybody have the uh, supporting documentations with the pictures that we have uh, sent out? Yes, we have all materials for this item. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, so as you can see from the pictures uh, included in our application, uh, the construction has been completed. However, in a manner that does not leave uh, the required setback to place uh, an enclosure between the pool and the house. Uh, we have told the pool to be six feet away from the house, and uh, I'll explain more on how that uh, happened uh, uh, shortly. Um, however, we need a setback of four feet from the house and four feet from the swimming pool for a total of eight feet uh, to be able to place an enclosure between the uh, basement a sliding door and the swimming pool area. Uh, so we have, uh, as previously when we applied for the permit, uh, permits for swimming pool enclosures did not uh, uh, go through um, zoning as they do now. And uh, we had the plans approved and I, uh, our application was extremely thorough. We have provided plans for the, uh, bu uh, the building plans for the new house itself, which included elevation drawings, showed where all the exits are. Um, and our plan was to build a pool in this area. That's the only place where we can fit it, um, which has been approved. No, no uh, comments uh, regarding uh, enclosing the basement um, entrance to the pool. Uh, our plan was, uh, from our understanding, was that we only have to enclose the main uh, floor access. Um, and 
and we proceeded with the construction uh, as as we might have, and we were we're ending up in a scenario where we have to uh, apply for a fence exemption right now because we're unable to put uh, what what is highlighted in the in the bylaw uh, uh, for to to enclose the swimming pool area. So we our plan initially was to retrofit the patio door. Uh, to have bolt locks six feet above grade, and that's and that's to make sure that no child is able to unlock those doors. Um, so that's a, that's a bolt lock placed on, on the top of the patio sliding door, uh, six feet above grade, and uh, that's our, our, our original plan as as for the permit application, uh, which was approved. And uh, we feel like there's no other way around it uh, better than this way. Uh, other than removing the patio doors completely and putting glass, which is a very extreme measure, we we believe um, granting this this ex exemption will also allow us to um, we have we have a deck at the main floor level that's 14 feet high. Uh, the railing around that deck is 42 inches instead of 48, which is six inches shorter than what it needs to be to be classified as a pool enclosure. Um, we have installed a gate, uh, a complying gate for a pool enclosure uh, that is 48 inches at the access area uh, from the deck. However, uh, the remainder of the railing around the deck remains to be it remains to be 42 inches. Um, given the grade of the deck that it's 14 feet high than grade, uh, we don't feel it's a it's a necessary expense for the client to. Uh, purchase a uh, a new railing, which could cost uh, about ten thousand dollars to 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 get that done. Um, and uh, we're looking for a, an exemption uh, to to allow us to keep the current railing and uh, to allow us to proceed with the original plan of of closing the patio entrances, uh, making them part of the enclosure using bolt locks placed six feet above grade. That would be all. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? Councillor Carroll? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the pictures. There's a structure at the back. I, I, I see the pool runs sort of lengthwise from beside the, the, the basement uh, door there. But what's the big brick structure at the back of the backyard? Uh, there is there is a, an outdoor kitchen um, under under the deck. So uh, on the on the west side of the backyard we have the pool. On the east side we have the deck that is uh, coming down from the main level of the house. Uh, as I mentioned, between no, 13, I mean it at the rear grade. part of the backyard. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the picture in attachment three on page six of the report, and there's a brick structure further away from the house. It's right at the rear of your yard. That is that is a hot tub. That's a hot tub. So there's actually two bodies of water in this backyard. Why would you not Correct. run the swimming pool across the rear of the yard so that it it wouldn't be close to the house? We have it. We have a tree that we were adamant to preserve. Obviously, it's a beautiful, uh, very old tree, um, and uh, obviously, one uh, there's no way to put a pool over there because the removal of that tree would not certainly not be granted. Uh, and we believe also this tree should uh, should stay and should not be uh, jeopardized in any way. That's why the placement of the hot tub was closer to the tree where there's no deep excavation needed, and the pool had to be placed on the west side. In that lot, um, uh, other properties nearby have been able because they do not have trees in their backyard. Have been able to put the pool or, uh, along the back. For this specific backyard, uh, we believe this is the only way we could have uh, placed a, a pool in that area. Last question: How deep are these bodies of water? How deep is the hot tub, and how, how deep is the pool? The hot tub is uh, three feet deep. The pool is uh, four and a half. So it's uh, uh, a Thank standing you. depth usually. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll. Any other questions for the deputant? Councillor Robinson, no? No? Okay. Um, questions for staff? Councillor Carroll. 
Yeah, um, this one, this one is very difficult. I, I'm wondering if staff can give us some insight into what sort of conversation would have taken place at the uh, at the the counter if you were applying to do this uh, um, uh, to build this house. Would the fact that the basement is walk out not not have been clear in the plans? Why was the focus on telling him he had to make the main floor safe, but 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 it it, it doesn't seem to have been addressed that you, you have a walkout basement, and you, you and that's no good for a pool. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. It's James Slocum, a supervisor with Municipal Licensing Standards. I'm uh, in today in lieu of Eleanor San Giuliano, who's on retire uh, vacation until retirement. Uh, your question is quite uh, straightforward. The bylaw does require a fourth fence that separates the uh, residential dwelling from the pool. That was in the actual application, and as the deputy spoke to, there's no. There's also a requirement in the bylaw that the body of water has to be four feet from the pool enclosure, and just this is just a matter of real estate. They don't have four feet between the residential house and the body of water. And unless they wanted to just uh, relocate the pool and maybe not have the giant brick hot tub, just have a pool. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, any other questions for staff? No? Okay. Um, Councillor Robinson, we're on speakers. What would you like to do? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what to do with this one. I was actually going to just move this, uh, the recommendations, uh, recommendation number two, to approve this. Um, my understanding was the fence was just a bit shorter than it needed to be. So um, I'm also happy to defer this or refer this item back to staff. Um, so, okay. Um, hmm. Would you like to refer it back? Councillor Robinson? Yes, I would. Are you moving ref uh, referral or, or one of the options before us? That's what I'm Yeah, I'd like to see the backyard with the basement doors. Um, Okay, so I think there's a conclusion here that the file may be incomplete to come to a decision. I don't know, Councillor Robinson, if you concur with that. Would you mind if we defer to the next meeting and, and then we can get a more fulsome discussion? Um, can, we get her to, can we get her to phone in and... But, you, but you're not speaking to anything. There's nothing. I'm, not, I'm getting clarity from. While there's a bit of a lull in the action, Mr. Chair, I have to leave at 3:30 for at least um, 20 minutes or so. Um, do you have a quorum? Um. Will we have a deferral pro uh, a, a, a quorum problem in at three thirty? Is was that the question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, we 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 hope we can finish up. But anyway, um, a motion for deferral. Yeah. So Councilor Cole will be back in a minute. Um, just um, Councilor Philly, let me just do a head count in your absence and make sure everyone can stay. Uh, I realize this meeting has been quite long. Um, Councillor Councilor Carroll is moving um, deferral of this item to the next regularly scheduled community council meeting. With, with the caveat, do I need staff to refer? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to move the deferral, given that Councillor Robinson is having connection problems. It sounded like that was her in, in intent. But if I could add to that, I would really like to see staff's comments on the basement doors. I'm, I'm most concerned about the basement uh, door one and door number two. 
And so I'd really like to see how he's going to address it. So if that could come back with the deferral and staff's comment on that, that would be great. I got two R's. All right, so um, we have to vote on this. Uh, so this is this item is being deferred uh, to the next regularly scheduled uh, community council meeting and an undertaking of staff to provide, I think, more clarity on basement doors entering to the backyard. Is that? Okay. So, oh, we've got a motion drafted already. This is great. Yes. Yes. We still need that larger font. Um... I'll read it for you. I'll be your seeing eye counselor. <laughs> Does it cost more money to make the font larger? <laughs> yeah, well, we're yeah we're asking for more yeah clarity on the on the positioning of the of the basement doors. Okay, that that. Let's vote on. Okay, um, de deferral is on the floor, and we're we're doing this on behalf of Councillor Robinson. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Next item is uh, twenty. Um, twenty-seven. Yeah, my daughter's. I'm sorry, Ryan. I'm sorry, twenty-six. Item twenty-six. Uh, Twenty-one. Glenn Gowan. Um, is Ryan Heath there from Boots Bets Pools? Hi, Ryan. I'm here, Mr. Chair. the host. Yep. You are connected and unmuted. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Community Council. Um, so just to give you this, is, I, I'd like to think this is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, it's a pool enclosure uh, that was has been installed. Uh, the main change was merely the materials of the fence. Um, the pool enclosure bylaw only permits wood fencing, uh, wrought iron fencing, and uh, chain link fencing. Uh, my homeowner chose, with with after consultation with her neighbors, chose to go with vinyl fencing materials. Um, I'm not sure why historically vinyl fencing materials have not been uh, a pr an approved option with respect to the pool enclosure bylaw. Uh, it appears they are becoming much more, we, we build pools every day and we're finding more and more uh, clients are choosing to go with vinyl fencing materials. The vinyl fencing materials this used on this property. This is the had... speaker. We need to pause the meeting. So if you could please um, stop with your sure. speech and no then problem. we will let Sorry. you know when you can resume. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Hello? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Councillor Robinson? I'd Do like you... to move staff recommendation number two. Yeah, I'd like to move staff recommendation. Oh, um, your item, your uh, Councillor Robinson, we've already deferred your item. I do apologize. We thought that was your intention, and we couldn't reach you, so uh, we did an under twenty-six. Uh, twenty-five. Um. 
Yeah. So we were we were just uh, uh, Jay on on twenty six. We were in the middle of a deputa deputation and our our online viewing crashed. So um, we're kind of in the middle of twenty six. Is your intention to um, grant the application? Correct. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Mayday, Mayday. We can hear you. We can hear you. You're doing good. So, um, as I said, we were halfway through a deputation for 26, and um, and then we still have two more of your fence exemptions, and we're going to lose quorum at 3:30. So um, I'm going to. This conversation is open to the general public, so I, I'm just going to uh, contact you privately about about our quorum problems. If it should assist the chair, I'm happy to end my deputation in an effort to speed your process along. So, all right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Heath. Uh, are we back? Are we back live? Can we? Can we? Yeah, we can resume. We're good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, back to Councillor Robinson. Um, if I heard you correctly, you were going to grant the exemption on item 26. No, we defer 25. Yes. Yeah. So I know I'm going, I'm speeding ahead to, because of quorum issues. Uh, I'm assuming there's no other speakers and I'm assuming there's no questions for staff. All right. Um, okay, Councillor Robinson has moved um, granting the exemption, the the application for exemption permit number two before us. Um, all, all those, all those in favor? All those in favor? Opposed. Uh, that carries. Um, Councillor Robinson, you have um, two other fence exemption requests here uh, with about with with only about nine minutes to go before we could lose quorum um, are the are these deputation deputants still available a David Taylor and a Stephen Carr oh yes so let's let's hear let's hear David um, and then um, we'll see what Councillor Robinson wants to do Stop. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. My name is David Taylor. I'll try and keep this brief with the time pressure. So I'm a landscape architect uh, with a project on Wilkett Road. Um, so there's a portion of the pool enclosure fence that was installed with uh, wood boards that were um, smaller than the minimum of 19 by 89 millimeters in dimension. Um, and I just want to add a little bit of detail to this. Um, I understand the, the intent of this uh, portion of the bylaws to ensure that the, the horizontal boards don't warp and create a handhold or a foothold um, and allow someone to climb the, the fence. Um, now, even though the, the boards we installed are a little bit smaller than that, uh, we did put in a, additional bracing in the fence structure that uh, about every three feet um, between posts so that the, uh, the boards would uh, be secure and not warp and, and very robust and not allow in, in the, um, not, uh, not allowed to be climbable at, at any time in the future as the fence ages. So, I mean, we feel that the fence is quite a robust fence and, and provides a really, a very secure uh, barrier to, to the pool entry. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, questions for the deputy and Councillor Carroll? Yeah, just a quick question. So how yes. far apart are the stays? So the, the main posts are about six feet on center and every about every three feet we have a, which a is framing member to, to, nail, to nail the boards to. Which, so is, the, which, is, a, a, um, which is narrower than our, our requirement. Correct, yes. 
I don't know why we don't just change our bylaw to that then, if it <laughs> solves the problem. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, we just have a lot of, you know, a lot, quite a number of, the, the fence boards are secured quite well every three feet, so they, they, they don't have a chance of warping. And there is a gate in the fence. There is how a gate is it, in the fence. How is it locked? Uh, it's uh, self-closing hinges, and it has a um, uh, mechanical punch code lock. Pound okay, lock. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the deputy? Oh, um, Councillor Robinson. Oh. I think she's still frozen. Councillor Robinson? No. No, oh, I don't no. have any, none. Oh, you don't. Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much for your deputation. Um, questions for staff? Um, speakers? Uh, Councillor Robinson? Or Wilkie? Yeah, I'm moving to. Uh, you're granting the application? Right, yeah. Okay. Any other speakers on the item? All in favor, um, granting the application on uh, item 27, 23 Wilkett Road. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. So we have one item left. Um, do we have a Stephen, a Stephen Carr available? This is the House of Stephen Carr. You're now unmuted. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief, and I appreciate your your uh, patience in getting this uh, far. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members, for allowing me to address you. My wife, Suzanne Carr, and I have been residents uh, on uh, Abbeywood Trail in the Denlo neighborhood for over 25 years. We are both concerned and active residents, having had the privilege of appearing before this very council about 20 years ago to arrange for stop signs to be put at the intersection uh, as we live very not far from the Denlo School and we are continuing this. Last year, my wife and I decided to put in a pool um, at, at long last. Uh, the uh, bylaw enforcement officer, Bruce Quick, uh, was there, uh, approved uh, everything but questioned uh, one small technical aspect and he wrote an email in support of our application, but he wrote it to Elena San Giuliano and Gail Price, uh, just seeking their confirmation. Apparently they did not confirm, and hence I got my notice of violation. But according to Bruce Quick, the bylaw enforcement officer for the city, he confirmed that there are two separate self-closing and self-latching locked metal picket gates that la latch uh, onto a center post. I noticed that the time shows that I'm already at five minutes, but I just began. I hope that's from the previous individual. Um, the gates uh, do prevent access from the walkout basement uh, into the pool area. They are located outside the patio doors. Uh, one step down, I did submit photos with my application. The posts and the gates are not attached to the wall of the building that forms part of the enclosure. The posts are located about four inches away from the wall of the building, but more than 12 inches away from the sliding door itself. Um, the gates are five feet in height, and Bruce Quick, the bylaw enforcement officer, confirms they exceed the height requirement for a pool enclosure. Uh, the gate design, the description, and the location were stated accurately and were provided on the pool enclosure plans that were submitted to the city. And my contractor did, in fact, install the gates as per the issued and approved permit, uh, something that, they, uh, that both he and I uh, relied upon. Uh, the permit uh, states that the zoning and fenced enclosures have been reviewed and had been approved. Uh, the, I, I'm just watching my time. Um, I believe I've complied with the bylaw requirements regarding no access uh, from the wall of a building that are not part of the wall, but uh, I, I believe I've complied, uh, or actually Bruce Quick actually wrote to um, the city, Elena San Giuliano and Gil Price, indicating that it was also observed that creating uh, the fence box type area outside the patio door would encroach on a walking path below my stairs which would effectively perhaps impact the accessibility under the stairs, people banging heads, 
uh, trying to walk there. And most importantly, he said, nor would it increase the safety aspect of the enclosure. I believe the owners have complied with the requirements in the bylaw, as well as the spirit and intent of the bylaw that prevents access to the pool area from the home and ensures the safety of the children and others. Uh, he also finished by saying this information is being provided to you in order to request that this gate installation and location be approved. In all respects, my wife and I, through our contractors and the landscaped architect who we relied upon, uh, wanted to make sure and did our very best to ensure that everything that was accurately represented on the plans was done, that was confirmed by the bylaw inspection officer. Uh, there are three metal gates. The other two were approved without hesitation. This third one was asked a question and, and hence the notice of violation. Uh, we are uh, hopefully one day going to be having grandchildren. Uh, we are very concerned about making sure that everything is safe. I believe the bylaw enforcement officer did confirm that and I am seeking um, your approval for uh, an exemption uh, from this uh, so that I uh, may uh, abide by the bylaw and uh, comply for any future uh, replacements that may occur in the future. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your deputation. Any questions for the deputant? Okay. Questions for staff? Speakers? Councillor Robinson? Oh, I'd like to move then, uh, staff recommendation two. Okay, staff recommendations approve, two. Approved. And that's your, okay. Um, we have other speakers. Um, Councillor Carroll. Yeah, this one's, this one is a tough I, one. I'm going to have to leave. You have a quorum, right? One, two, yeah, we got, Sharon? yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I expect we're going to support the local council, but I'm afraid I can't uh, on this one. Uh, this is exactly, this one is, it's the type of fence and the fact that it's attached to those. These are the exact kind that, that led to the bylaw in the first place. It's, it's in fact too similar to the situation that killed my cousin. Um, a five-year-old boy can, is just going to pull a dining room chair over to that in a heartbeat, and, and he's going to be over that fence like a shot. It's, it's just, it's the temptation and the forbidden fruit of having it on the door and such a climbable piece of apparatus. The reason you don't want it close to the house is to just drag the kitchen chair over. Um, if there's space between the fence and the house, you know, they got to get that, that thing out of the house and down the stairs and all the rest, they don't. But just so quickly, if that door is, uh, that French door is open, um, he's over that fence like a shot and, and that's how kids die. And so uh, uh, I would like to move the alternate recommendations, number one, and, and uh, the, the refuse to grant, um, just for my own conscience. Yeah. May, may okay. I address thank, that? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Any other speakers on the item? May, may I address that? Uh, no, no. No, we're, we're done with deputations. Um, it's in committee now, and there's two motions on the floor. One is to uh, refuse the grant, uh, to grant the application. The other one is to uh, approve it. Um, Okay, so Councillor Robinson's motion would go first since it was placed first. Um, and she's, she's granting the application. You want it recorded, Councillor Carroll? Uh, this is a recorded vote. All those in favor? Yeah, so. All those in favor of Councillor Robinson's motion to grant. Uh, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Cole, Councillor Robinson, all opposed. Councillor Carroll, that carries. Councillor Carroll's motion is redundant. All right, thank you. That concludes our business for today with one exception. Uh, we're going to introduce and pass the general bills. I'm giving, uh, giving one to um, Councillor Carroll and one to uh, uh, Councillor Cole. Oh, let me pass that on for you. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I think I gave the first one to uh, um, Councillor Carroll.
Okay. That the North York Community Council pass and declares bylaws bills 459, 480, and 481 prepared for the May 24th, 2022 meeting number 32 of the Community Council. And I had to check my computer because I can't believe it's already May 24th. <laughs> all right, all those, all those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. Councillor Cole. I move that the North York Community Council pass and declare as bylaw uh, a confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the North York Community Council acting under delegated authority at May Third meeting 32 on May 24, uh, 2022. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So that uh, concludes our business for a very long day. I'd like to thank uh, all the clerk staff for their wonderful work, the IT team, uh, my colleagues, city councillors, and of course all the deputants uh, who spoke today. I'm so, good, I'm good. And city staff, of course. <laughs> So thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the day.